Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Stephen Zuber. I'm Jess Dickey. And we have a patron tier. At the $10 level, people are allowed to uh, choose a topic for us to talk about, which is a thing that we're going to do now because we have, what's his name? Emilio Alvarez. Emilio Alvarez is actually donating at the $24 level. Uh, which Jesus, thanks, man. Nice. That is awesome. Yeah, that's really nice of you. Yeah, and like I mentioned, mentioned today when I was PMing you on Discord, you also get to co-host at those levels. So yes, whenever you want to come on and hang out, you totally can. And I went through recently and PM'd the backlog of patrons. And one thing I tried to emphasize with everybody is that like our rewards for the first couple tiers aren't all that interesting. So if there's any small thing that you want, we're more than willing to try and find something that we can do with for you to in exchange for your generosity. So. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, what we could do a thing like the adventure zone where if like somebody, uh, posts their name on Twitter, then they'll like mention they they'll use their Twitter name as a character in the show. Maybe we could just do it. Like if we are making an analogy, it'll be like an analogy about Christy snow who gave us $5. <laughs> <laughs> they... So will say Christy snow had, I don't know. They do that on the, uh, uh doof cast was on um, a trolley weaver dice as well. To... Oh, really? This. Did they start doing that? Yeah, if, if you mention them on tweet on Twitter, then they'll put your name on the in the in the next Weaver Dice episode. I find that really delightful. Mm-hmm. Actually, like I, I'm glad that there's people that like first of all will pay for something like that, and I can totally see why they would because that would be hilarious to have your name. <laughs> I won't show tweet up about it. That you like. But how about this, Matt? I will just shout out that Weaver Dice is something that you guys occasionally do on the We've Got War We've Got Ward podcast. And so I'm still broadcasting this to people. I would love for a villain or a hero named the Stevenator to show up in the show. <laughs> I think that'd be hilarious. Nice. So, what would its power be? You guys decide that. You guys decide how quickly you want them to die. I think that'll be really funny. But the Stevenator would be a hilarious cape name. Just Heck saying. Yeah. <laughs> cape or what is the villain's? Capes still. Oh, they're also capes? Yep. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So Emilio Alvarez wanted us to talk about the Anthropic Principle. Yes. Which is what we are going to talk about due to this awesome request. And I guess only for as long as we can. We've got some other stuff we want to hit, but yeah, because I'm not, I I asked for some clarification on it, and there's some that we can try and hit. But basically, the anthropic principle is ooh ooh ooh. I had a perfect intro to this. Go for it. Okay, I was going to say the anthropic principle, like most things in reality, all started when God created the world and everything within it. Because <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the first place I encountered the anthropic principle, and probably a lot of other people, or at least a version of it, uh, was the question, you know, why are humans perfectly suited to live on this planet if God didn't create us uh, to live on this planet? And he look, he made the world just right for us. The, the temperature is just the way it should be. The humidity is just where it should be to support human life. Obviously, this was created for humans. Can I retort? Or are you finishing your... Please retort. So, a couple of things. So, well, I guess we'll... we'll... Daisy changed the definition of anthropic principle from that, but I'll just retort very quickly that if God wanted to, he could have made us able to survive on the surface of the sun in a vacuum if he felt like it. Oh, hush. So, <laughs> now so, you're just so, being too logical about things. Yeah, well, no, another but, thing is that I, I, I'd never found that argument to be very compelling because people are like, look, th- this, look at this world. It's great. It's perfect for us. I was like, wait, have you seen the world? It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it's dro- got all kinds of diseases and sharp objects. And <laughs> it's a shit-ass <laughs> argument just <laughs> on its face. You drop a snake at m- mostly anywhere on the planet and will die within you know a few days to a few hours. Hours. yeah um so but i mean just saying that if, if you were an all-powerful god you could have made us be able to survive in a vacuum in space mm-hmm. so i never found that compelling that the so that, that's like the strong anthropic principle like the weak anthropic principle is more I, actually there's actually more fine-tuned definitions than the ones that i'm going to hit on so forget that i mentioned strong and weak but <laughs> you can just point out that the fact that the universe exists with constants that could hypothetically be different well wait, um, that's uh, Yes, that okay, that's the next step. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say the, the very um the the most natural objection, the easiest objection, I don't know, is that saying, look, it's not that the world was suited to for us, it's that we are suited for this world. The world was here first and we evolved into it to evolve on, to live on it. And if uh, the world had been radically different, we would have evolved to be radically different. Oh, but Inyash, if the strong nuclear force was a little less strong, exactly. stars wouldn't last long enough for planets to sustain life. That's, Therefore, blah, blah, blah. That's the next level of sophistication once people know a little bit more about <laughs> physics. They're like, you know, well, yeah, the if the electromagnetic force was a little different, there would be no atoms at all, you know? All these things, con- if the gravitational constant was different, then we would either be expanding too fast for molecules to form or all crushed down into a supermassive tiny thing at the center of 
of everything and uh and the the anthropic principle reply to that is if that was the case there wouldn't be anyone around to ask what is happening uh, why you know why are we here to see this yeah. so the only universes where an intelligence could exist to ask this question is a universe where the uh conditions are right the the uh constants are set at levels somewhere approximating this so that something intelligent can evolve to ask i don't even get why like the, the, there's so many things that never have made sense to me about this argument like uh it, it's always like everything around us was made just right for us and i'm like well no we we're an evolved thing we made ourselves we like <laughs> yeah. developed the ability to exist in these circumstances but it wasn't like it was like set up exactly right because they knew that eventually humans you needed like this temperature and this level of electromagneticity and this like it, it we the, the analogy, dragged our way into existence <laughs> the analogy i always heard was that was probably stupid we did a lot of hard work to survive in these conditions millions and millions of years of it <laughs> the analogy i always heard was that a puddle woke up and it says holy crap look at this hole i'm in that is perfectly shaped to fit exactly me <laughs> it must have been designed by someone not realizing that the puddle was fit into the hole not the and other way the around sun was coming up and soon it was <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and the sun is called unfriendly ai <laughs> just keep the analogy going yeah. what does the grass represent <laughs> but what, but then you know the question is why isn't the gravitational constant something other than what it is because that one's actually a decent question yeah i think the anthropic principle is more cosmological than it is anything else mm -hmm. um or like yeah it's more physics than it is biology where biology at its root is physics but like it's not so much of hey look we have eyes that are adapted to see within a range of a range of, of uh the electromagnetic excuse me the electromagnetic spectrum that lets us see various things like you know po uh, be able to detect food and stuff at a distance it's like no that's not an accident because that's the evolved thing like the 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 question behind that is like how come light works at these wavelengths how come yeah. how come uh atoms bond at this strength I or whatever i almost yeah. feel like um, that starts to get into the whole why does something exist as opposed to nothing and like the, the the question where it's like that's not even all like i see why you can phrase that as a question yeah. like why why grammatically that can make sense as a question but like it doesn't it's not even really a thing to ask like why is there something film? rather than nothing I've, but like do, do those concepts even make sense something and nothing well no that maybe I got two thoughts on that. Go for it. One is that some some physical constants, like the speed of light, aren't constants in the sense of um, uh, like couldn't be otherwise. Like Planck's constant just happens to be like the smallest measurable distance between uh, what two subatomic particles or something. Um, I don't know. The, the, the speed of light is <laughs> just so. is the measured observation of how fast light goes. Mm -hmm. Light could go faster or slower, and then that would be the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So like that one is an is an observed uh measurement so like that that constant the fact that it happens to be the same everywhere maybe that's a question that you could ask but uh what its speed is um is is something that you observe by looking at reality and then finding that it's uh like one that mm, like i think saying, I like so some of the answer to some of this is because that's the way you're interpreting it well because yeah because that's what you've measured um like Okay. There, there was somebody there was a funny uh i forget what subreddit i saw this on but it was like oh yeah you know and then the sounds so obvious something like might have been a troll but um you tell me that the universe isn't beautifully designed why does water freeze at zero degrees celsius and boil at 100 <laughs> degrees celsius <laughs> you're gonna tell me that that's not like on purpose mm -hmm. and it's just like that is on purpose that's why we we built the celsius around those two those two things those two properties of water yeah um so like oh, the, yeah. the the melting point of water with regard to Celsius isn't a uh isn't like a constant that you're like trying to explain. It's right? like the banana man thing. Yes. <laughs> banana man thing? <laughs> Where like why Ray, is a Ray banana Comfort. so perfectly designed oh, to right. fit into the human hand? Yes, it like yes. clearly had never seen an, a banana before it had been cultivated by humans. Yeah. Or any animal or plant that we eat currently. They're all like they've been warped over time by by genetic engineering. Let's just call it what it is. I get so mad when people are like, CRISPR is like e evil and scary, but like horticulture is fine and natural because we're using viruses to do it, but we can't see that. Or radiation. <laughs> radiation. 
So delicious. Th- there is like a non-religious approach to the anthropic principle, which like in well, my the things we were talking about was the anthropic argument, which is slightly different from the anthropic principle. That's right. The anthropic argument is more of like a more theology trying to like kind of shoehorn its way into a science like argument, yeah. right? And um, how do we feel about the answer that if life, if conditions for life were impossible, there wouldn't be life here asking these questions? So that's more of like addressing the principle than it is like so the argument i i just to as long as we're bifurcating those things i feel like the, res- the, the proper response to the anthropic argument for something intelligent designing the universe or something mm-hmm. is like this is not that well designed for people um almost all of the universe is super bad for us right hence the universe but isn't designed for us the universe is designed in a way that we can exist and assuming that these constants could be different, which is not a thing we know for sure, but we don't see any reason why they couldn't be different. Uh, there is a vastly huge space of possible universes, and in almost all of them, life could not even possibly exist. And so then to me, the anthropic perspective is to say, yes, we don't exist in those universes. Right. Right. So That's, like That is the anthropic principle. Or also, like, life as we know it, we still don't know a lot about the different forms life might be able to take. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But but us specifically, we happen to exist in a universe that can sustain humans. Yes. Yeah, um, I mean. Where it's happened to be as kind of tongue-in-cheek because, like, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be wondering this if we weren't in one of those universes, right? And this... So basically, this presumes that um, this is not the only universe, right? Um, like the biggest thing that comes out of this is Max Tegmark's um, different levels of uh, existence where, you know, it what in his opinion, he's a mathematician, it boils down to basically any universe that can be described by math does exist. And um, so we just happen to be in one of them where the conditions are right for us to exist in, but all potential universes do exist. Yeah, I have no it's, trouble granting that. I I mean, I don't, I don't see why that's necessarily the case, but it makes a lot more sense than ours is the only one that exists so, and just happens to have these properties. Like we, Since we don't know about the other universes because they're inaccessible to us, either in principle or just in fact right now, um, we're working from a sample size of one, but we have no reason to believe that we're the only one. Um, like, I remember when I was a kid, I used to wonder why... And like without even a good scope of or scale of like where the Earth was in the uh, in the galaxy or something, I used to wonder. Like I had like this in my head. It was like this big thought when I was like nine, <laughs> and I'm like, why is the Earth like over here when it could be way over there? Right. Yeah. Um. And it's like, well, I'd be asking the same question from over there. Yeah. Yeah. Like it. It. it and if that sounds stupid, that's because I was thinking it 25 years ago. No, um, it doesn't sound stupid. It's the thing that kids think. <laughs> well, it sounds yeah. like a pretty smart thing for a kid to be thinking about, honestly. But most kids don't think about stuff that deep. Well, I mean, yeah. I don't know how deep I got with it. I'm not giving myself too much credit. But the, I think, it's the same sort of just like realization that like, okay, yeah, we're having this conversation from here, which means that this is the kind of place that we either can be or where we in fact are. Um, <laughs> so, well, well, again, it sounds funny. Because it sounds like it's almost dismissive, but it, it is just, that's why I see it less of like a, a principle of understanding things. I guess it kind of is. It's just more like a lens to through yeah. which to answer these confusing questions. And yeah. it's like, well, um, why don't, what if we lived in a universe where, you know, if, if the, if you went up 10 feet from the earth, surface of the earth, you'd burn to a crisp. And I'm like, well, because the earth varies more than 10 feet in height across the globe and we wouldn't, we wouldn't survive there. Right. Um, like, why does life seem fine-tuned? Because it happens to be it where we are. It is fine-tuned by evolution for, yeah. Yeah. I, for me, the fact that this is such a tiny space uh, that we happened, of possibilities, that we happen to hit in our universe, for me personally, is strong evidence that either there were n- no real other options for these constants, they had to be this for some underlying mathematical reason that we do not know, or that there is, in fact, uh, a near infinitude of universes, and we, you know, obviously are in one where this is possible. Um, because if it was possible for there to be any of these constants, and there's only one universe, and it happens to be this one, I find that extremely unlikely. That said, if that was the case, and this was a one in a ten trillion shot, mm-hmm. we still wouldn't, like, 
the fact remains that we are still here having that. So if we won the one in one trillion lottery, like yeah. we just did, um, yes. like, no but, to... but that is that is unlikely. That is so, yeah, that but... is very. Well, how unlikely. can you, you can't say that it's basis. likely or not? We only have one piece of evidence. Yes, yeah, like really you know... can't you can't use statistics on it if you don't have any priors. That's a good point. We also don't really know like where universes come from or the circumstances that can set them up. So like right. maybe the maybe the life cycle of a universe is that it just runs through one set of constants, then everything collapses or expands into not, into pointless, you know, heat death. Yeah. And then for some magic reason, they start over with tweaked with tweaked fundamental constants, or maybe they don't. But then that um, means over an infinite time period, eventually you'd get through every type of universe. Exactly. Yeah. So we're currently the one that support that is capable of supporting uh, this kind of conversation. That's why. That's why I say my my now my guess now is that we either have a almost no possibility of there being constants other than this or we have infinite universes because it just being this by coincidence is so extremely unlikely that as a good bayesian i should adjust my probabilities of that happening by coincidence to very small well and there are like there are some things that you not impossible. that we do understand that you can tweak that if you tweaked it then it would tweak other things like mm -hmm. um so one place where i read about and thought that this sort of discussion was more in the like fighting the fine-tuning argument which is the other name for the anthropic argument mm -hmm. um the universe is fine-tuned for life therefore mm -hmm. it was on purpose um what's his name victor stenger used to teach uh physics and boulder actually he died a few years ago but he wrote some atheism books in atheism's heyday I didn't know he and died. i'm 95 percent sure he's dead okay. um in any case one of his books was god the failed hypothesis very uh not subtle title um <laughs> oh but it but that was nicely, a pretty popular book yeah and it, it nicely explains uh what his thesis is is that this is a scientific hypothesis that we're going to look at and I don't, and i don't think it checks out um so he talks about the anthropic principle in there a little bit and he, uh, victor stenger was also on the team responsible for measuring the mass of neutrinos uh successfully the first time huh. and so like one of the things is like well if there was one tenth or excuse me one order of magnitude less the number of neutrinos and than there was in the universe um then everything would expand much more faster or much 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 faster than it currently is and he's like yeah, yes time to coalesce into matter right but he's like yes but if there was i think it's like what 10 to the 36th neutrinos or something in the universe mm -hmm. if there was 10 to the 35th there would also be that much less uh um or like what was dark it? matter or whatever the fuck it was like basically gravity uh, what, what, like whatever some, for some reason I can, i'm not a physicist I it, it was his either. understanding that if you tweaked the number of neutrinos you also tweaked the amount of constant gravity in the universe and thus you could tweak it a bit and those numbers would just kind of balance out on the mm. other side of the scale mm -hmm. so yeah. like that particular one does relate to other things um so like some of these constants you can tweak some of them you can't uh yeah but i'm with you like i, I i'm kind of fine with like the multiverse interpretation of it i'm fine with the like i don't know <laughs> that's not a very good question <laughs> like why are things <laughs> like it's it almost isn't really coherent as a question as far as i'm concerned and i feel like a bit frustrated having to try to come up with a coherent answer to what seems to me to be kind of an incoherent question that's like my main reaction to the anthropic principle or argument argument you don't yeah. find it unusual that that uh the constants are at the level they are and not different no okay. <laughs> i would find it more unusual if we have they are <laughs> yeah, they, i mean exactly. obviously they are but i would find it more unusual if we happens to discover that the constants of like physical stuff in the universe were incompatible with life as we know right it. if we discovered <laughs> that then i would be surprised the fact that we happen to find them to be yeah. consistent with where we're at is not surprising it just strikes me as like a frog sitting there going why am i a frog i could have been i could have been a horse mm -hmm. or a blade of grass but i'm a frog why am i a frog i need to know the answer to why i'm a frog and not something else and i'm just like no you don't <laughs> actually you could worry about other things because that doesn't seem like it's first of all a valid like route of inquiry <laughs> like well, i'm not sure what it's going to teach you at the end i think um i don't know i'm not sure if my like the way i'm trying to protest this is making any sense <laughs> no it because it, 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 it puts it more in that that anthropocentric anthropo that's hard to say i'll say egocentric perspective where it's like you're answering it for like well i'm from i'm i'm right here having these thoughts like why aren't i somewhere else something else sometime else having these thoughts like <laughs> 
because I'm not. Do you feel uh, the same way about the, um, God, what is it? The why aren't they here yet question? The Fermi paradox? Yes. Do you feel the same way about the Fermi paradox? What the, it's weird that we haven't found life yet. It's weird that um, we can't exist at all and that we haven't already been colonized before we began to evolve. Um, so no, the, like, the I don't think so. I mean, I, it's a, it's very hard to, I don't know. Um, so it seems what, like what within at say? least a thousand years or so, if we don't wipe ourselves out, we're probably going to be colonizing the galaxy or starting to, right? Humans? Maybe. Uh, we, we don't know. Again, this is another thing where we have no priors except for us. Uh, so there's no way of saying, like, isn't it weird that things are like this and, and not like this other thing that they might have been? Because, <laughs> like, is it weird? I don't know. I don't know how rare this is for things to be like this. We Maybe it's not. <laughs> I think the, the Fermi paradox is is confusing because, like, the ingredients for life are abundant throughout the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, like, what, carbon is one of the most common elements in the universe. Oxygen, another very common one. Hydrogen's fucking everywhere. The most common element in the universe. From what um, we've seen from exoplanets, there's actually plenty of exoplanets out there that could harbor life that are in the same position we are. In. That, that are in the Goldilocks zone yeah. around their suns. So, like... I think the Fermi paradox would be more troubling to me if we were in year 28 billion of the universe rather than 14 billion. Yeah, we haven't been like sentient for very long. No, we haven't been, but there's been a lot of planets that have been around for a long time. Before yeah, and ours maybe long. they had whole sentient civilizations that have arisen and fallen and we'll go find ruins floating around someday. Or maybe we won't. I don't know. <laughs> like, So I think... There's a lot of pretty good, uh, I forget what some of them are, but there were some pretty good explanations for why, if life does exist, we haven't seen it yet. One of them just being, we haven't been looking for very long. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're very young compared to everything. I mean, Robin Hansen specifically uses this, calls it the, the great filter, that uh, the fact that we haven't seen any alien life already colonizing us is probably a good sign that almost all civilizations collapse at some point before they start. Uh, yeah, or, or something happens. We don't yeah. know. Something the, happens where they don't go out and start colonizing the galaxy. This strikes me as a baby, like laying in their cradle, being like, "Am I the only thing in the universe? Like, right, I, I've it... never seen another human being before because, like, you've been alive for like a few minutes." <laughs> no, exactly. So you, but and there's the baby... like so much other shit going on around you that you can't comprehend yet, and you have no sense of the scale. Yeah, and, and which you should even wrong. measure. There is lots of other stuff around them. Yeah, I mean that, that's what I feel like. I'm like, there's probably. Like, we're asking questions that don't feel very productive to me, where it's not so much of a, like, here's the thing that I'm, I wonder why it's, I don't know. There's some things that I think that this is worth asking th this question, because we have ways of actually trying to do experiments on it. Whereas, like, this sounds like the, I'm a baby trying to ask adult questions right now. <laughs> like, we need to know much smaller things first before we could start asking those big things, because we still don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> like... Well, to do... But we understand that we can colonize other planets. Like, it is within our personal grasp technologically within the next coming decades. We don't know that. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that we could. Yeah. I think that, like, right now we can visit other planets. Can we settle them? Maybe not yet. But I'd be, I'd be very surprised if the century wore out where we were unable to settle Mars. Yeah, maybe we um, wouldn't do it. But we would have the capability. Yeah, well, we like might we're almost there right in the now. next ten years. So, <laughs> like, exactly. Well, that's that's the great filter problem. Like, yeah. does everyone don't destroy know. themselves before they start colonizing? We don't have anything to like base this against. We don't know how rare or common things are, so it doesn't make any sense to start trying to say that things are weird. I think the fact that it looks like it should be pretty darn common, and that it's absolutely not common at all to have you know, colonizing life forms in the galaxy. We don't know if it is uncommon. We don't know if we just don't, haven't seen any of them yet because we've been alive for two seconds. Well, we know for sure we haven't seen them. I or, mean, I, we don't, like, we don't know if they're not there and we just haven't found evidence of them yet. Cause... Right. We have found no evidence of people colonizing the galaxy. And we would expect to have found it if they I were... I wouldn't have. Like, it, it, I'm just saying that, again, we haven't been around for very long. Where These might be things that happen really frequently over very long scales. Right. And if they happen really frequently, then... Like, maybe there was just one species that super colonized the galaxy right before we evolved, and then, like, they all destroyed themselves, and then we're at that period of that kind of thing arising again, <laughs> and then <laughs> colonizing the whole universe again, and then and them dying again. Right. That's, like the... That is the great filter problem. Like, if but... things didn't destroy themselves, we would expect to see them, so... And we're not seeing their radio waves, we're not seeing their technology, we're not seeing Dyson spheres. Yeah, um, we're not seeing There's, there's some pretty good explanations for why we might not be seeing those things. And again, I'm, I'm I don't remember what they are, but I heard some very plausible, like, 
reasons that, for why we haven't picked up anything. Totally. But it might still be out there. And and that like so they could be. I think they what's I think the and probably Hanson put it this way. Their first, meat me. is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful story about why we may not be seeing them. We'll have to wait. What was it? If they're made out of meat. It's um, a super short, short story. Do you, uh, do you want to spoil it? Because I, I think I've heard this actually, but I'm forgetting. Yeah, they actually made a short uh, YouTube view, uh, video out of it during the writer strike. While some actors were out of work, it was it's fucking <laughs> great. But um, yeah, the the short story is two aliens talking to each other about this new life form they found. And they're like, yeah, the life form on this planet, they're made out of meat. And the other <laughs> alien's like, what are you talking about made out of meat? And they just, they go back and forth for like two, two and a half pages, like trying to get it through this guy's head that these aliens are made out of meat. And finally he's like, let's, let's just put in the official records that this planet is uninhabited and move on. Because <laughs> no one wants to meet meat. <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> it's a great story, man. Um, but... Oh man, that, that, yeah, that would be like if we, you know, put a lot of effort into exploring the universe, and then we found a planet that was just bed bugs, and we're like, mm. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Going to go ahead and write this one off as uh, I don't know, um, whatever. Let's, you know, if we had anything in the backlog of our science books, like I wonder if this will destroy a planet. Let's try it on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's better that future generations just not know that we found this yes. <laughs> this doesn't need to be keeping people up and let's just pretend that that's that doesn't exist so but like the other... fact that you exist is evidence of some things that things can exist yes and the, <laughs> <laughs> exactly that is that is that it and the that might be surprising based on your priors like if you think that these constants could be anything, that might be surprising. If you think that it's um, not terribly difficult for life to get started and to evolve up to our level, then the fact that there isn't other life around might be surprising. And so you use the fact that you're around and that you're not seeing evidence you think you would see to draw some sort of conclusion, right? No, I, I still don't think that we ha we have an, enough knowledge to even be able to start generating like questions about these sorts of things. Because again, we don't know. You keep saying it might be surprising, and I'm like, we don't know if it's surprising because we don't have priors. Like, that's still my answer to this. I I'm not like worried about any of these things yet because I feel like we don't have enough basis with which to even start thinking about them. I think if you aren't worried that we might be approaching something that wipes out our civilization no i'm worried about that but you just said we, you weren't worried about it I, i'm not worried about um the the questions of like why do things exist versus not I'm, I'm worried about whether we could wipe out our civilization because we do have priors of civilizations wiping themselves or others out well i mean that's one of the things the anthropic principle tells us that we would expect to not see ourselves existing that we would have this planet would have been colonized already but it hasn't and we do exist so that is worrisome because it tells us things about what happens to life before it starts getting to the galaxy colonizing phase. And since we're touching on like Fermi paradox stuff, part of it is that with the admittedly low priors we have, but the reasonable deductions we can make about the abundance of, uh, of organic matter or organic building material in the universe and how easy it is to build self-replicating molecules here on Earth, and then the number of Earth-like planets in the cosmos, why aren't they sending out radio signals? Why aren't we seeing their spaceships? Why aren't they, you know, if they were... Why do we they, exist at all? They should have colonized the Earth, and we would have never gotten a chance to evolve. Well, so that one you can answer anthropically, because they, in fact, haven't been here yet. But yeah. The, but the other one of, like, if they've had 10,000 more years to do stuff, you'd think they'd be doing some pretty interesting things that one could observe from light years away. Um, since we're not seeing those things... It seems to indicate that either they're, for some reason... Maybe one of the first things that species do is make cloaking shields. It so could that be. no one can see them. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's also a not uncommon answer to that, that um, species hide because the universe is dangerous. And if you start sending out lasers and radio signals saying, Hey, we're here. Is there anybody home? Somebody comes around and eats you. Which, like wouldn't be good for us because no, no, it would not. <laughs> i think right now we're waving around the hey <laughs> yeah, that is another reason to maybe be worried about the fact that we haven't seen other aliens <laughs> is everyone else staying silent for some very good reason i mean so there's the filter of life getting started in the first place there's the filter of life getting complicated mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily have to once you've get self-replicating molecules mm -hmm. um, those could be all over the universe but you just see nothing more complicated than like 
sludge, yeah. right? It's entirely uh, possible that the filter is behind us, in which case we are set and we know why the galaxy is empty because there was some great big filter which we got lucky and got through. I think it's fun to, or at least more informative for me to view it as multiple filters, mm -hmm. where like one of them is life getting started, one of them is life getting complicated, like in the eukaryotic sense of, you know, complicated cells and then cell organelles and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then organisms is another, another whole step involved. Um, I could think of at least two or three more, but like yeah. intelligence is, isn't a requisite for, or isn't a, um, uh, intelligence is, or sentience, or I guess intelligence. they're a little bit correlated. Yeah. I, th I think they're correlated at least here on earth. And I imagine they're correlated elsewhere, but that's purely on speculation. Um, like intelligence doesn't necessarily seem, uh, mandated by the fact that, that there's pre, that there's, uh, conditions for replicating molecules in that life right or on mm -hmm. that planet yeah. so like you could have a whole planet with nothing m smarter than dogs running around right it seems like kind of an accident in history that things as smart as humans got around on our planet a whole planet um, of dogs that'd be great right <laughs> i want to go there yeah. um, pet all the good boys if the universe is big enough there's probably a planet just full of puppies gold yes. retriever puppies and another one with border Puppy planet um, oh man <laughs> so like intelligence evolving in the first place is another another filter i think mm -hmm. and then Another filter, one that we're coming up against next, is can you get, you know, to the point where you can, uh, you know, what, star fare as a species mm -hmm. without blowing up the planet first? Right. Um, maybe that never happens. Maybe the first five always, you know, happen every 50 years across the cosmos. We just never see it. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the last one, you know, no species so far has made it to the technological stage where they can uh, travel the galaxy without yeah, blowing themselves up. Maybe faster than light travel is actually impossible yeah. and nobody actually just gets very far. I got a question for Jess then because trying to bring it back to the anthropic principle. <laughs> Basically, you're saying that the fact that there's intelligent life exists shouldn't be surprising because intelligent life does exist. Because the word surprising doesn't make any sense in this context because we don't know how common or uncommon that is. Yeah. Um, so this is this comes from a post about the anthropic principle back on old less wrong stuff. Um, nuclear war obviously a bad thing, and we should try hard to prevent it. And we as rationalists all celebrate Stanislav Petrov Day on September twenty sixth for one of the guys who helped prevent the human race from being wiped out by deciding not to launch nukes when he could have, um, and should have according to operational <laughs> procedures at the time. Thanks for not destroying the world. Yay. Uh, but the, the story that we tell about that and about several other nuclear incidents makes it seem that the human race came really freaking close to wiping itself out on at least a number of occasions. And it's, uh, therefore somewhat unlikely that we are where we are. Uh, we just managed to get lucky a few times. Um, the... Anthropic principle counter to that would be if we had gotten unlucky and the human race had been wiped out, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Yep. So, I, what, go, sorry, finish it. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, if, if you're going to ask me a question, then uh, I'm going to wait and see if this was going to be the question before I say something. Okay. Well, since that means we can only exist in a world that didn't dissolve into flames, as this post says, then... Uh, then it shouldn't be surprising that the Cold War uh, didn't end because, or that the Cold War didn't like turn into a, a not Cold War. war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That uh, since uh, since we're here, it's entirely possible that there is many universes where the Cold War did uh, erupt and all of humanity is dead. But uh, we are here to observe this, so we're in one of the few universes where that didn't happen. Obviously. We are also in the universe where, um, I don't know, like maybe there's a parallel universe where somebody discovered the cure to all diseases accidentally and there like, is really fucking great stuff happening in this other universe and we're in the shitty timeline. We just don't know it. Yeah. Well, we're not in the shittiest timeline because we're not dead. Right. <laughs> um, like, assuming that you take that as yeah. a requisite for shittiness. There's a, a related thought that I tossed around in my head for like 10 years and then eventually was able to articulate enough to Google and to find that this actually has some stupid name like quantum immortality or something. Mm -hmm. um, I might have mentioned this before. But <laughs> oh, I know this. I, I've come, this I've... I found this actually very like comforting to think about when I was first deconverting. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it was just like, I've come close to dying a ton of times. Mm -hmm. Probably more times than I'm aware of, which is actually scary, right? I didn't see every bullet that I missed or that I dodged, right? Um, 
and yet I'm in none of the timelines where I got killed. Uh, so, like, optimistically, I might... The, the consciousness that's in my between my ears right now mm-hmm. might make it some, you know, at least... Uh, so Even, I guess how, how to extrapolate is confusing. If every and, and universe vague. exists, the universe where you're immortal exists, and that means you're immortal. Even that, if that, that's actually very has almost no chance of working, eventually you'll wake up in the universe where it does work. Exactly. Yeah. So that part's pretty cool. But there's also this is another just anthro anthro uh, anthropocentric bias thing, anthropic bias. I keep saying <laughs> anthropocentric framework in that I currently live in none of the timelines where I was killed, mm-hmm. um, which is a like almost useless tautology, except for the fact <laughs> that it it is also true um is this a thing you agree with since you seem to be this anthropic skeptic here um i mean the... you can't disagree with that <laughs> i think it is I... tautologically true yeah well right but are there other universes where i don't know we've died i don't know if there are other universes okay so in that case is it extremely surprising that we that like steven's alive is it ex- extremely surprising that the human race is still around you keep using the word surprising no because yeah. again we don't we if we don't know you can't do statistics on something if you don't know like or Bayesian statistics if you don't have priors i might say I rather than surprising, we have priors on what the chances are that we made it through the cold war though right and we have priors on what the chances are that steven is still alive we don't know what the odds of not surviving the cold war were because we only had one or, or something right mm-hmm. so like that those might be hard to get numbers on but like for me what's more fun to get numbers on well then it would just be somebody else sitting here having this conversation but like this is also one of my big problems with the movie us um which i really loved large parts of it if they had said like oh, to spoil the whole ending <laughs> The, it's just magic, Stephen. Yes, but they didn't say that in the movie. They tried to explicitly say it wasn't. I, okay. And so <laughs> it's a horror movie. Everything is magic in horror movies. If if they had said this is purgatory, this is hell, I'd have been like, oh, of course. No, that's no, so fucking this cool. is the real world. So it's the but real with wor- horror magic. It's the real yes horror magic. But they, <laughs> yeah, but, they, okay. but, they, but they try not to say horror magic. They try to say science experiment. You never say horror magic in a horror movie. <laughs> you just have your horror movie. All right. So you say like hand wavy is maybe plausible reason why this is happening, but my, don't don't worry about that though. It's not fallout relevant. My thing is that when two <laughs> organisms mate, the any any chance of any individual sperm uh, fertilizing the egg is fairly slim. Um, you know, much of the sperm will never make it there. Some of them do, some of them do, and the odds of any one getting in there is pretty low, right? If you were to like take a bet, you know, in advance at the, at the moment of ejaculation and say I'm betting all my, all my all my horses on that one, you'll lose, right? Yeah. Um. So in the movie Us, there are like genetic identical copies going back generations mm-hmm. of people. And so not only are the people mating at the exact same second because their kids are all the same age, but it happens to be the same sperm and eggs being fertilized at the same time. So that, that whole thing, that's it's, it's so, not science. It is a mirror world. All right. So, so of that, course, everything is the same in the mirror world because it's a mirror <laughs> in the mirror dimension. Great. Perfect. Just say that. <laughs> okay. Just say that. So what, I will say what, that what is there not to get? It's the mirror dimension that's in the tunnels underground. Because they're pretending it's not the mirror dimension. They're pretending it's a place that you can just walk to. You can walk to the mirror dimension. All right. It's in the tunnels underground. Okay. Le- leave, leaving us aside, I will no, say. I, I also I agree with you that I hate when fantasies try to be like this is a science thing. It, it's not actually magic. It's quantum stuff. It doesn't matter. The, the, the only time it matters is when it's like Deepak Chopra and he's trying to sell something. <laughs> then it's like, shut the fuck up. Well, I mean, yes. it doesn't matter to the audience what the explanation is. It, like, I, the, nobody is sitting there going, wait a minute, but like monsters aren't real. So this movie <laughs> makes no sense. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, you know, you're going to see a horror movie. You can be like, science stuff happened. Now we got a monster. Anyway, now the plot. Okay. So <laughs> that works in movies where there are like random monsters, like the, A Quiet Place. Like, that was great. They came from space, they yeah. came from underground. Who knows? Who cares? That was awesome. There was a movie that was a complete ripoff of that that's on Netflix that I forget what it's called, um, hmm. where it's like these bird monsters instead. They look like little pterodactyls. <laughs> and they're attracted, really to, they're, they're attracted to noise, and they come peck your eyes out and rip you apart if you make a, if you make a sound. That sounds less cute. Yes. Oh, is that um, the mm, bird box? No. No. That, that's where if you see something, it never shows it, you kill yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> You probably see what you probably see in Bird Box see, is this terrible of... movie that's a rip off of A Quiet Place, and then you yeah. then you have this Im- Im- Damn, irresistible impulse to blow like your brains box. out. Point is, is in that movie the the Quiet Place rip off that I can't remember what it's called. The monsters come from this whole underground. They're like just mining or something, and all these birds come swarming out of there. Mm-hmm. So to say it's just monsters, well, these things are said in the movie to have somehow evolved because they must have. And it's not clear what they were eating or how they like how they, okay how, they, they how they how like... they how they were there in numbers enough to decimate life on Earth. 
My thing um, is, I don't care like of, about the specifics of your backstory unless you thought of something really cool. If if you're like just trying to say, but people are going to be like, oh man, where are these bird monsters coming from? And oh, but that that explanation doesn't make sense. Like you know, uh, it's not rat fiction. I, th- I think that like as even as a rationalist, yeah, exactly. Going into a movie, there's a certain higher level of disbelief that I'm willing to suspend, and I'm okay if they don't spend too long on trying to make fake explanations for stuff. They just go like. I don't know, the science lab exploded, chemicals leaked, now you've got this thing, and then now like, now there's the cool stuff that goes on with the plot. But like, no, those ones the premise is there's a big monster. But then when they take like a really big amount of time, and they did like maybe 40 minutes of Wikipedia research on a couple of science terms, and then they try to spin it into a, like, this is a plausible thing that could oh, happen God. if yeah, quantum things annoying. do this thing. And they've got like doctors in lab coats for some reason, yeah, even though they're yeah. physicists and they don't need a lab coat. Like, <laughs> and see, that's like, the reason I liked us because they didn't do that yeah it was just mirror dimension underground you're just gonna make yourself look like an idiot if you try to like like i keep remembering prometheus when it was like this is how biologists work right yeah hey look i found i think i found life i'm gonna poke it dude and prometheus were like primordial earth they seed the earth with these these (laughs) genes and that is why we're so look just like the aliens on the other planet even though it's been 10 million years of you know divergent evolution i love when non-science people like do again 10 minutes of wikipedia research and they think that they understand a concept enough to be like it would be so cool if my backstory was this thing that actually if you did 20 minutes of wikipedia research you would know made no sense we just stop doing that (laughs) we'd be closer related genetically to strawberries than we would be to those aliens after that much time consult a scientist if you're gonna put if you're gonna put science in your thing and then make it a big deal of like part of your movie and if you're not willing to do that then just be like i don't know science stuff happened uh hand wavy things now now there's a monster <laughs> yes so, I, I, have a on, fir- I, I didn't okay. finish my i didn't actually finish my thought i got di- right. i got sidetracked on on us yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's it i'm told i love the movie and <laughs> I, i'm fine with science magic in movies i just didn't like how they pretended like it wasn't magic yes exactly. like like in um in get out it was magic and it was like that was awesome. It was scary. It was great. It um, wasn't magic. They used a science chair with like a surgery and a laser. If they had said this science is how it chair. worked, if they if they had said this is how it works, and I knew for a fact that there's no possible way it could work that way, then it would take me out of the movie like it did with us. That's all. So yeah. the reason I brought up us in the first okay. place yeah. was that because I brought up how unlikely it was that the parents would copulate at the exact same time, if, even if they're mirroring the, the motions of the people on the surface and copulating at the same time. Again, you're that thinking the same, that they're different that people. The, that the same... It's a mirror dimension. They're the same people. Let me finish my people. thought. Okay, my, sorry, my, sorry, No, no, sorry, my point sorry, is, is that the odds of me personally existing are infinitesimal. Mm-hmm. That's the point I was trying to make. Okay. And I was making that through the point that us is impossible. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so the, the movie Us makes no sense because the odds of, of any fertilized combination co- coming about is very small. Yeah. And that's true going back generations. Yeah. And so if, you know, if we run the clock and... Uh, There's, yeah, a lot of causality stuff on a very micro scale that you wouldn't be able to replicate. Mm-hmm. Like the the butterfly effect thing, like just molecules flying around the air slightly differently in this other universe would make things significantly different. So exactly. That, there's no way a mirror worse could actually exist unless it was magic. There could be literally a butterfly involved that ruined the intercourse, <laughs> that, like that slightly delayed or prolonged the intercourse of my great, 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 great grandparents. Mm-hmm. And then I would be a different combination of genes, right? Man, I hate when that happens. The butterfly so, landed on his dick just at the right time. <laughs> you know, no! Little... <laughs> so, Slow motion butterfly at least flapping. <laughs> my, my point is, is that what the anthropic principle would like i could ask why am i me and not somebody else mm. but that is the sort of question that you can ask from anybody any anybody's point of view yeah right? i so, think well i think that's a dumb question that's not the anthropic that's why, principle question no that is it is the question all right well here I why, have a, why are things question mark that, have, that's, <laughs> that's an anthropic lens to view history through whether or not it's the the wikipedia page on of anthropic principle or not it's the same for me it's the same sort of of lens of understanding the universe like things are this way because they happened to be this way i have a fairy tale from less wrong which i think will hopefully clear up things because i think i've done a very poor job of describing the anthropic principle then let's do it okay this is an anthropic principle fairy tale <clears throat> thank you to nominal on uh, august 28th of 2012 for posting this a robot is going on a one-shot mission to a distant world to collect important data needed to research a cure for a plague that is devastating the earth When the robot enters hyperspace, it notices some anomalies in the engine's output, but it's too late to get the engines fixed. The anomalies are of the sort that, when similar anomalies have been observed in other engines, 25% of the time it indicates a fatal problem, such that the engine will explode virtually every time it tries to jump. 25% of the time it has been a false positive, and the engine doesn't explode at all, it's a perfectly fine engine. 
and 50% of the time it's a serious problem but not a automatically lethal one, so that each time there's a jump, there's a 50-50 chance the engine will explode. Anyway, the robot goes through the 10 jumps to reach the distant world, and the engine does not explode! Uh, the... whoops, sorry. Unfortunately, the jump coordinates for the mission were a little off, and the robot is in a bad position for collecting data. It could try another jump. If the engines don't explode, the extra data it collects will save many lives. If the engine does explode, though, the Earth will get no data at all, because this FTL radio that they're using only works one time. So how do you program the robot? Do you program your robot to believe that since it worked 10 times, the anomaly was probably false positive and it should make the jump? Or should it um, send the data back that it has right now? Do you make it believe that, due to the anthropic principle, it should disregard the evidence of the other 10 jumps because obviously in the universes where the robot blew up, those uh, it's not here to make this decision. And it still has a good chance of blowing up. People's I, lives are in the balance. I don't think the anthropic principle applies here. Why not? Because you have prayers. Yeah, but the only evidence that he has is that he's still alive after 10 jump. Or uh, it, I guess. I, I don't know why I gendered the robot. Sorry. But you have the evidence of how often this kind of failure causes the engine. So you just crunch the math on the 25, 25 versus 50. Um, the importance of delivering the data you have now versus the no data versus the goal and then you calculate based on that and decide like squinting at it with your values is the risk worth it so basically you completely abandon the anthropic principle yeah. and just say okay. because the anthropic principle isn't like it's not a thing it's <laughs> it's not it's not a I, I still don't think that it's a a question that you can actually ask i think that we as humans um, care about causality in a way that doesn't actually make sense in the way that physics works because we are things that do things that cause things and we've got some kind of machinery that crunches so hard to try to figure out the root cause of everything that we look at but some things don't have root causes in the way that like matters to us or that matters at all or that even makes sense that's my long weird answer to that okay i feel like disregarding the anthropic principle for the, for, or let me rephrase that, for the for the robot to make the decision to say, you know what, anthropically I've made it so far. Mm -hmm. I'm probably good to do as many times as I want because I'll, conti I'll continue to persist in the universe where I don't blow up. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like, with me running with my observation that I haven't been killed yet, to like, I don't know, uh, try and dodge bullets like Neo in the Matrix and be like, well, right. I'll be the one that makes it out. Yeah. Like, that sounds like a really bad idea. Okay, so you would not jump. Um... I, the only thing that's different is that, like from my analogy of trying to, I don't know, whatever, dodge bullets or do something else like that has a one in a thousand chance of me surviving. I, I, like, I don't take those risks because I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. Despite my weird, I don't, not even belief, just like this weird idea in my head that I might never die. Right. <laughs> um, You've never died yet. All evidence yeah. points to the fact that you never will. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, not how you think. Right. And that's definitely not how I operate. But I also don't have numbers. Um, so but then that's also not how you think about the universe. And so you should put a much higher prior probability on the fact that God exists to create, have created the universe exactly how it is. Well, let me just have I'd actually answer the robot what? thing. It sounds like because I'm... Because if, if I was, you Wait, wait, wait. Both of you are trying to talk at the same yeah, time. Yeah, let me yeah, yeah. let me answer the robot thing first. Okay. I think if I was the robot, I would conclude after 10 jumps that I'm probably on... I'm probably in the 25% probability zone where mm. i had a false positive okay because that's a lot of coin flips to come up right mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i'm assuming like okay cool my my engines are probably fine that's pro that's where i'd oh, probably okay. end up okay and I, that that kind of reasoning makes sense that you add the probability that the engines are probably fine to that calculation and you disregard the anthropic principle because it doesn't apply and what are you going to say? Yeah. Well, how, how does God come into this picture? <laughs> well, God comes into this picture because then if you're discarding the anthropic principle entirely, you can't use it to explain why the universe... But there's so many other like really compelling reasons why God seems to not exist. Well, yes, but <laughs> it's still it, extremely... It, it would maybe... Yeah, take, taking away one of my negative evidences for God would raise me from like, you know... Okay, Seven thousand six hundred billion. But like for some something decided that these constants should be the way they are in this universe for a specific reason, as yeah. opposed to random chance. And I don't know what, and that says nothing about whether it was God. But like, you're willing to bite that bullet to say that something designed these constants to be what they are. No. Oh, I thought I, you just said yeah. No, I like. I'm saying that I don't think that the anthropic principle makes any sense as a question. 
Um, I don't think the, the the why are things question mark is a you can make it into a grammatically correct sentence, and then it seems like because it's a question, it should have an answer. But I think that that's just a glitch in our brain, in our way of thinking about things in terms of causality. Uh, I don't think that I think that we're poorly equipped to think about physics in ways that we probably should be thinking about physics. And this one is just you're trying to anthropomorphize like physics, and then, uh, yeah. Okay. I think that the, quote, fine-tuning argument is very weak evidence for some sort of intelligent creation. Yes. So, like, it, it sounds not... It doesn't sound like evidence in favor of... Well, I guess it is, but very, like, nothing that I'd it's ever bet on. It's one of the hypotheses for why are things like this. Right, yeah. So, like, I could say, okay, cool, maybe it, there exists a reality above ours where they have computer simulations running, where they've tweaked the cosmo cosmological constants that everyone's concerned about in all these anthropic questions and or in these fine tuning questions. And this is one of those universes that can sustain life. That, that sounds not impossible. It's not high on my expectation list, mm -hmm. but yeah. All right. Can I hit two more bullet points before we move on? Please. Okay. Uh, the first one is a fairy tale. That's not actually a fairy tale because it actually happened in real life history. Uh, the I'm assuming you're both uh, familiar with the Large Hadron Collider. Yes. Uh, at the time it was being built, and I think still to this day is the largest super collider ever created. And uh, they there... have to change its name if not. <laughs> well, so, then they can note. just make a larger Hadron Collider. Side <laughs> note: that is like the naming convention in a lot of physics and astrophysics things. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, we have the we have the large array of of, of telescopes. <laughs> well, now we have the very large array because we it's have bigger. the big fucking array. Yeah. What's that thing? <laughs> Do we actually have that? <laughs> No, I wish we did. Oh, okay. I what's, know there's an XKCD with this. What's that big black hole? What do you want to call it? Well, black hole sounds like a good name for it. Perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah. I believe oh, it was black hole. I know Big Bang was originally like used as a derisive term by someone who didn't yeah. who thought it was poppycock. I'm not yeah. sure if black hole fell, uh, went that way too. I'm not sure. I just love how that seems to be a, a theme in naming things in physics. Yeah. Anyway. Physicists are very much like, let's just get to the point. Yeah. So we've got the LHC. We got the LHC, yes. And at the time it was being built, uh, there were a few people who said, uh, you know, we don't actually know what's going to happen when we smash these particles together. It's a tiny, almost infinitesimal, but non-zero probability that we could create strangelets, which are a type of particle that when they touch a different particle, turn that particle into themselves. So it would create a change reaction that would turn all of uh, matter into just strangelets and... Basically, all life and everything would cease to exist because everything is now this one type of particle or this one type of um, subatomic thing that doesn't interact with things like the quarks we're used to interact. When you say there were some people concerned about this, is this the same group of people that was worried that we'd accidentally make a black hole? Like the non-scientist idiots? Uh, well, well, let me rephrase that because that's so terrible. <laughs> the the non-scientist... Subatomic particle physics. The lay person. People. How about that? The, the, lay, the lay people who were also like of the mindset of these highly trained scientists don't know what they're doing and they're endangering all of us. There were, or was this a scientifically informed concern? No, but there were a few. Um, it, this was a scientifically informed concern because there were a few subatomical uh, experts who said this is a non-zero possibility, but it's so unlikely we're not taking it seriously at all. It just seems ridiculous. Okay. Uh, so I would go with their consensus because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. But then like weird things started happening where the Large Hadron Collider kept not being turned on when it was supposed to be turned on. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's they, they've invented time travel in the future and they're going back to be like, don't use the time collider. Well, not even necessarily that. Uh, time travel doesn't have to exist for the anthropic, anthropic principle to work because... Uh, I think one of the things that happened is like a squirrel found its way inside or some kind of small varmint or bird died just in the right spot inside and you know a tube. what that was? What was it? That was um when all humans got wiped out from the Large Hadron Collider, the squirrels became sentient and then they developed time travel no, and they sent no. their squirrel ambassador no, 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 back no, no, in no. time. No, okay, no, 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 no. There's no time travel involved. <laughs> the thing is, there's an absolutely know. infinitesimal chance that a squirrel would get into the Large Hadron Collider and chew on this one little thing and short it out for months on end. So it didn't happen in almost all universes and they turned on the Large Hadron Collider and it destroyed the Earth. The one that we live in are, is the one where the squirrel managed to get in and stopped the Large Hadron Collider from being turned on. And, you know, when that happened, ah, ha, ha, okay, that's a coincidence. Guess we're down several million dollars while we fix this shit and wait a few more months. But, like, this happened three times in a row. 
And at what, like, really ridiculous, insanely unlikely coincidences. And at what point do you say, maybe we shouldn't turn this fucker on? I don't know. I've worked with technology and really insane, crazy coincidences that break your technology happen a lot. I agree. <laughs> and I mean, they did eventually turn it on and the world did not end. But the question is, how many of those would have to happen before you would say, let's not turn it on? Like, if we got to the point where 20 times really stupidly ridiculous things happen... I'd start, I'd start being worried at that point. Okay. Like, yeah, that, 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 that... Or at least confused. Because it happened three I, times. I would notice confusion if something seemed like... It happened three times, and after three times, a few people started saying, Hey, guys. <laughs> but again, that's like, also because we do have priors of how often these kinds of weird things happen... Well, we like, don't have priors on how often squirrels break into yeah, super not, not colliders, that specific right? Thing, yeah. so, but like, like maybe that happens one hundred percent of the time. We build super colliders have, in Switzerland. We have it some happened. amount of data for how often. Like, what, there there are ways that we could actually run Bayesian analysis on this and be like, how likely was this to have happened? Because we have data on similar things happening or not happening. <laughs> Counterfactually speaking, if the fourth time had been like and someone we, dropped yeah. their hot dog and slipped on it and managed <laughs> and the Benny to... Benny Hill theme started playing. <laughs> yeah, right. If something ridiculous happened and it got delayed for a few, another few months a fourth time, at that point, would you have all given credence to the anthropic principle and being like, gosh, I'm really worried about the number of universes we've destroyed now. See, that at that point, I might keep trying to turn it on, but to like... <laughs> I'm like, okay, so if someone's doing something to interrupt this, then like, keep sending them. Like, <laughs> let's let's really push this. Like, if if something is going to consistently like keep happening in order for us to stop doing this, it's not like they're going to be like, ah, they they keep they flip the switch three times. Now they're about to flip it a fourth. I guess we tried to warn them three times, but no, no one's trying to warn anyone. <laughs> it is entirely just a matter of luck. Well, yeah, and which universes survive. The more weird times that happened, the that would up my expectation that we're living in a simulation or there's some intelligent hand making things yeah. like imagine if you know we had squirrel proofed it we had uh said no food allowed so no one could trip and die or choke on their food or whatever and then the two people go to start it and they both have aneurysms yeah. like at that yeah. point i'm like okay cool it, something intentional is we're happening or something very yeah i mean like so pe happening. people have aneurysms that happens i'm curious but for this to happen like yeah, again now, this on, is the on fifth the thing yeah, now yeah on, so i'm curious why would you go to it is someone is coordinating this rather than uh, there are we're human an infinite and we assume number of that causes are made by causers like us. Yeah, but okay, <laughs> that, that's maybe my intuition that's generating it. I haven't finished your question. I'll see if I can answer it another well, way. Well, my my, basic, my question was just yeah, why is there a causer rather than there's an infinite number of universes and we are killing ourselves in almost all of them, and mm. the only ones that are still around to wonder how weird this thing is are the ones where some stupid, crazy, ridiculous accident happened. The last time I spent any time, like any measurable amount of time up until today, thinking about the, I get if it is called quantum immortality, I'm not sure. But that idea that like I like my my own uh, egocentric aliveness chain of causality. Um, two or three years ago, I was downtown. Somebody dropped their like reflective vest crossing a street. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get run over. I saw the light change. I ran out and grabbed it. And as I turn around, the, the truck on the other side of the intersection decided just to punch it. And as I turn... <laughs> I see their their mirror go right past my face. Oof. If I had moved while turning instead of just turned, mm -hmm. I would have been knocked over by this thing and it was going something like 25 miles an hour, but it was as tall as I was. It would have killed me, yeah. right? Yeah. So in that sense, I am like diminished in the number of universes that I exist in mm -hmm. because now there's one less Steven because in some number of universes, I did get creamed by that it's truck, the right? the Steven bottleneck. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, the Stevenator's superpower. Sorry, I think we were talking about this before. So was there we started recording, but was, Steven said, uh, "Oh no, that's going in." What is what? What, what should they make with Stevenator's cape well, power? Steve, yeah. Steven was saying that like he wanted there to be a villain called the Stevenator. Yeah, his cape power is just we insane to, luck. I, I said, "What power would he have?" But then we didn't think about it. I think that it's like to undo the Steven bottleneck and to just gather all the Stevens from all the universes. <laughs> but they're I mean, all but, dead. But. To, but but to like pull them back and then coordinate them in just the right way, like okay, this one from this universe does this, which interacts with this. So there's just a chain of Stevens causing things to happen that he wants to happen. Okay. All right, Matt, you heard that a reverse scapegoat level seven. That's what I want. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> By pulling Stevens from a bunch of other universes, um, who happened to be on the ladder, who dropped the thing, who caught the thing. So who <laughs> when that when that the guy who's trying to punch you in the face. When that happened to you, where you were <laughs> almost hit by the mirror thing, why did you think? wow, think of all the universes where the Stevens died as opposed to, wow, there is some causer that just saved me from being hit by that. Because it's the exact opposite reaction you had to the LHC. 
because getting hit by a truck is a fairly frequent thing that happens, I guess. Okay. Um, but and, it was a coincidence, basically, that saved you. Yes. So. And it would have been a coincidence that saved the human race in the LHC. But five or six bizarre coincidences in a row. You've had five or six times that you almost died in your life, right? Yeah, but not doing the same thing. I, I, I don't know. One of them seems more intentional, but that's probably me just being like applying too much intentionality to it. So, and it's easier from my perspective where like, obviously I'm able to ask the question because I didn't die. So the, 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 the thought, ex- the, the thought experiment with the, with the LHC is that every time they tried to turn it on or every time that they did, they destroyed a timeline basically. Every uh, time they did, they destroyed almost all timelines. The only ones that didn't get destroyed were ones where stupid rare coincidences happened. That's really funny. I, I'm just going to let that intuition pump for a while and have fun with it. I don't, okay. what was, is there a question I'm answering? This is a like, much more fun topic than I was expecting it to be <laughs> well, because I thought it was just going to be rolling my eyes and talking about how much I hate the Anthropic Principle. <laughs> but, well, my question was going to be why you went with uh, the coincidence saved you as opposed to a causer saved you for the truck thing. Hmm. How many times have causers saved you? <laughs> um, It's hard to say, right? If they're, yeah. as, if they're as subtle as, as putting squirrels in, in uh, particle colliders. Or as subtle as making you not move forward when you turn for some reason. Does it seem like this is a thing that could never have happened and it's really confusing as to why this thing might have hit you, but then you moved and it didn't? Or has that kind of thing happened in your life before? <laughs> no, that's the thing. It's not something that is extremely, like, it's not impossible to happen. Like, whether Stephen moved forward as he turned or not is basically luck. So it it doesn't need a causer. Nope. Hmm. But whether the squirrel got stuck in this tube or not was also basically luck doesn't need a causer either and probably didn't have one i guess i can i can view it from the other way on the lhc one which is just saying yes we happen to live in all the universes where the lhc didn't destroy the planet yeah uh or we happen to live in at least one of those um well but you live for a dark lords of the matrix explanation first because there were a bunch of unusual and like we said at 20 it sounds like it's it's conspiring to make this not it sounds like the universe itself yeah. like time itself is folding in a way that makes it don't let this thing turn on right yeah. well, all i would be at that point is noticing looks, confusion yeah, it looks that way but that's just because all the other universes where something crazy happened didn't happen are destroyed so you're only you're getting the illusion of somebody conspiring to make this not happen just by the fact that every time it did happen that universe is gone now so there's no one left to observe the evidence. That's a fun head scratcher. Okay. I, like I said, I, I'm not in any real way. I'm not attributing any causality or intentionality to any of these things because we're now talking in something too distantly hypothetical. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess at that point it makes me kind of wonder, no, it doesn't. It makes me phrase the question differently. Like what it would take, what would count as evidence of, you know, some intelligent force driving the universe. But that could just, I mean... The universe behaving in a way that we haven't observed that confuses us would be, like, some evidence towards that. But there could also be a bunch of other hypotheses other than there's, like, an intelligent thing, like, maybe like us that's doing things for some reason. <laughs> yeah, like, if, if the stars at night were to rewrite themselves into a message that said, hey, <laughs> look under your pillow, there's $100, and everybody who saw it had $100 under the pillow, that'd be super weird, right? <laughs> would that be... Um, that, I mean, that's not, that you know, sounds the like way, a... what they would do is it would be written in, in, um, in, um, um, Arabic and it would be a Quran under your bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. That, that was my, there was, there was a joke about Kamel Nanjiani like that, where he was raised Muslim and he had said that, you know, cause in, we're in Pakistan, uh, when oh, was a kid, women, can't w- women can't drive. He's like, you know, it says in the Quran, women can't drive cars. And he's like, okay. So if if it said in the Quran, which was written 1400 years ago, that women can't drive cars, I know two things. One, I would be at the mosque right now, and so would you, <laughs> and that women shouldn't drive cars. <laughs> if, it no, said but... that, if it said that in, a th- in, in 1500 years, we'll invent these boxes that you can push the pedal down and drive around in. See, the thing is, I'd still be like, oh, I guess Allah maybe exists, and also he's a dick. So, like, th- that's what I think about. If God exists, then I'm still like, if, if some, like, weird coincidence thing happened that, like, I was like, oh, well, it looks like the Christian God exists, I still wouldn't go to church, because I'd be like... Someone made the, the world like this. Someone him. made the world like this. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have some complaints. <laughs> Where's the line? It's time to I want to see the your revolution. manager. Like, first of all, germs. I like, <laughs> I like that your first go-to is, uh, where's the line? I want to see the manager. Whereas my first go-to was murder. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, like, uh, I really love, this is going to be a weird tangent. The, the, like, what was it? The Bewitching Tales of Sabrina, whatever the fuck the new Sabrina thing is mm. on uh, Netflix. 
there were a bunch of people that didn't like it for various reasons and a lot of the people that I did that didn't like it were people that identified as Wiccans or pagans and they were like, they're getting it wrong. It's I was like, okay, it's fiction, whatever. Um, they're they're misrepresenting wishes and I'm just like, okay, whatever. But like another thing was I was like, first of all, this this clearly like if you look at the structure of this show, it's like this girl discovers that well she, it's it's this like wacky alternate universe where everybody seems to be kind of fundamentalist Christians, but they're actually fundamentalist Satanists and the society is structured pretty much the same way, except they're witches and they worship Satan, but they still like have black mass and they have arguments with their aunts about like, Oh, but we can't do the baby sacrifice tonight. I have to date with Harvey. (laughs) And like, but like Sabrina at some point realizes that like, Hey, wait a minute. Satan says that like, these are his values, but then the way he actually acts, it's like, these are his values. You know what? Satan's a dick and I'm, and I'm going to become a stronger witch and find him and kill him. (laughs) And it was basically like, so I, I love the idea of the fact that the show exists. Uh, you could never make a show where, you find out that God is literally real, the, and like a, the little kid who was a Christian their whole life looks at what the world is actually like versus what the Bible is like, frowns, and is like, I'm gonna go kill God. I'm gonna go get, like, go on a quest, level up, find some magic angel swords and shit, and then, like, go kill God. Like, that would be the show that I would want to exist, because that would be my conclusion if I was like, oh, someone made this like this? What a dick. Like, this person shouldn't be in charge. <laughs> Two quick questions. One, is the new Sabrina show any good? Like, is it fun watching, it's, or is it just a fun idea? It's, um... It's, I'll say that it's got things about it that are problematic, and I'm okay with that. Right. On. Like, I, I really hate the mentality that a lot of people have, which is like, if any of my media has things that are problematic, then I boycott it. I'm like, you're also allowed to like other things about it and say, these parts were cool. Oh, that part could have been better. I also hate the word problematic. <laughs> it sounds like, I want to find something to complain about, but I'm going to be super vague and be like, eh, this is... This is, uh... It has the suggestion that it, it has a problem that probably relates to uh, social justice aligned concerns. <laughs> right, and they're the ones who use the word problematic. Like a if lot. someone yeah. says something is problematic and makes a cringy face, I assume I'm like, okay, is it racist, sexist, ableist, or some other ist? If they say it's Which problematic it? and makes a cringy face, I I can almost guarantee that I'll have no problem with what they're talking about. I mean, it... um, like no no one says like, mm. oh yeah, this 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 person raped a bunch of people. That was so problematic. <laughs> That's right? true. Okay, so, like, <laughs> I see what you're you don't, saying. You don't say something problematic if it's actually bad i, I see what you're um, saying so but anyway i will also say that like real wiccans complaining quote real wiccans whatever <laughs> that's like when they made the lady thor comics and people were like oh my god thor is like an actual like you know deity and what it's like thor's not real either yeah, you no. fucking nerds <laughs> um like the and and to be if we're going to nitpick the thor of the marvel comics is not the same deity that was worshipped 500 years ago and wouldn't you think that if he was real just the fact that they're still telling stories about him would be like, oh, they still care about me. It depends on <laughs> it depends on how uh, no, I totally feisty think you think the these Thor, gods are, right? I think that the Thor of the Norse mythology, if he were real, would probably like still be touched that people were making stuff in his honor. He'd chug a beer, smash it on the ground, and yell, Another yeah. <laughs> I mean Odin was apparently in the uh, the whatever um, the religious version of Odin is kind of an asshole, right? So he might not have. All the just... gods are assholes. That's what I like about the old gods is that but they, they were might, all like they, they might not appreciate human. being misgendered. So yeah. I will leave all that aside, and then I'll just do a quick skip thirty seconds. If you haven't seen the Good Place but want to, do you guys want me to spoil it for you, or do you want me not to? I have to? seen it. Uh, I haven't seen the last season. Do you want me to spoil it? If you've made it through the first three, the fourth one's actually kind of fun. So I'm not going to say anything. Oh yeah, I'm totally going to watch it. Okay, then never mind. Okay. Um, well, something happens in the good place that relates to this. It has it, watch it, the good place. It, I will say that <laughs> since, since I'm not going to spoil the ending, I'll just say that it has a fun problem that I think it solves weekly, but it still makes the show fun. I think it ended fun in a in a good way. Um, it raises when you watch it, we'll have an interesting conversation about utopias and see <laughs> the yeah. Okay. All right. It's not available on Hulu yet, is it? Yes. It is available on who? No, it's not available on Netflix. No, that's the problem. How it's much available on piracy. Probably like a year. Mm, maybe I should just yeah. just pirate it. Uh, just pirate it. I don't like pirating. Internet. We would never pirate anything. We're good copyright hearing patriots. Yeah. Wait, I wouldn't go so far. I absolutely would. Okay. I love I love my nation and its laws. <laughs> if you feel bad about it, pirate it and then like send some money to the creators of the show. How? That's what I. As long as I'm on that note, like I I I downloaded all of um. I never would actually. I never download anything. That's a crime. Mm-hmm. But you paid for it and then downloaded all of 
the uh it's called mythic quest raven's banquet it's a show by rob McElhenney. he plays uh mac on it's always sunny in philadelphia hmm. he runs a game studio where they like make this basically world of warcraft style game and it's fucking hilarious so it's like nine episodes long it's on apple tv plus whatever i don't want to pay for a subscription to watch this show but the first two episodes are available for free and like what i'd love to be able to do is venmo rob McElhenney <laughs> yeah. 20 bucks and be like i really enjoyed your show um, there's probably more money than, and granted, other people worked on it. They should get a cut too. I was gonna say that's kind of fucked up because a lot of people work on big group projects like that. But I could theoretically have watched this for five ninety nine for like one yeah. month subscription, and that's if it mm-hmm. took me a month to watch. There's it, a certain right? amount where, so like, if I could, I would rather just be able to give them twenty bucks yeah. and say, "Hey, can I have this? Great, thanks." But like, how do you split up that twenty bucks among everyone? That's the problem. Differently than you'd split up the six dollars among everyone. It, like when mm-hmm. you pay for, say, Netflix, then. Some of the money you pay is going to the creators of the show, and then a bunch of the money is going to the creators of Netflix who have created a platform and then limited your access to this thing that was created unless you pay for their whole platform. So at what point do you draw that line? Yeah. And supporting that, is a that good platform question. to keep it alive, and that makes sense. Like, no, you know, I mean specifically cost- how can you – like you'd have to know the – name and paypal address or venmo a name of every single person that worked on the project it'd be nice if they had like a shared bitcoin wallet or something that i could just you know shoot five bucks into my mm-hmm. point is it'd be nice like my other version of this is i think that it was available after the whole oh. season came out but like i'd have liked to be able to spend three bucks per episode of game of thrones to hey, just watch I've that got a, i've got a re- reply to that kind of um mm-hmm. maybe the way to do that is pirate the thing and then Tell everyone you know to watch the thing. I've been doing that. Yeah, and that that helps. How does then, that help? Because you're being free advertising for them. And maybe one of them will actually pay for it. Maybe two of them will, and then it'll be like I paid for it too. As as someone who occasionally tries to sell words, there is nothing as infuriating as a publisher publisher a publisher saying, "But we pay you an exposure." It's like fucking exposure doesn't pay for my food, homie. That's fair. You, you can pay me with money. Don't get me wrong. I totally agree. And I, I don't. that's why I think that there's no ethical, like, light side to pirating things. Mm-hmm. Like, I, sh- I shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is that if there was an option to go buy it for approximately what I'd pay to rent it from Amazon or to watch it on Apple TV, I would have. Yeah. Like, I would pay 10 bucks for the DVD box set. May I suggest libraries who usually have up-to-date, like, recent copies of books and music and other media. Yeah. The yeah, thing is that you have to... Borrow it for a certain amount of time, maybe stay on a wait list if it's really popular, and that's it. And libraries do always make sure at least a little bit of money gets back to the creators. Cool. Not as much as if you would have bought it directly, but better than pirating. Yeah, libraries are one of the major sources of income for people that make things, like mm-hmm. particularly books, but you know, they, they buy large amounts of the DVD or of copies of, of, yeah, whatever your, your book is that you published. Well, we, we don't live in a universe right now, unfortunately, where I'm trying to make it anthropic again for mm-hmm. fun. Um, where I can like direct support content that I like when there's more than a few people involved. Yeah. Like I like some podcasts and some other online created stuff where I can shoot them a few bucks a month mm-hmm. and enjoy their things and guilt free. Um, being like, you know what? That's absolutely worth ten bucks a month. Let me send Doof Media some money so I can keep make sure they keep doing what they do because I really enjoy consuming it. Yeah. But I can't do that for like I said, I don't want to pay for HBO and be locked in for some stupid contract. I want to watch Game of Thrones and nothing else, right? Yeah. So it would be nice if I could just buy them for three bucks an episode. Well, part of um, the problem is that a show like um, Game of Thrones takes a huge amount of upfront capital for all the, I mean, not just the cameras, but also the sets, the costumes, the writers. You got to pay all the actors, all the people working, you know, behind the cameras, the grips. That's a lot of money. And you can put out a Patreon for when you have already created something and people are like, hey, I like this thing, I'll give you money. But if it takes like a million dollars to get the thing going before you even have the first episode, it's going to be really hard getting people to sign up for, yeah, I'll give you some money now for something that maybe I'll see that might be good in the future. Or maybe it's going to turn out to be another one of those, what's a shitty show? <laughs> uh, the Friends spinoff, Joey. Yeah, maybe it's Perfect. another Joey. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Thank you. This yes. is a really good topic, and we could probably keep talking about it for a pretty long time. Right, and we should probably get back principle. on our other topic. I tried, I tried to veer us back by saying we don't live in a universe where I can direct, consume, uh, guilt-free yeah. things. But yeah. I, you, no. you needed to put more emphasis on we don't live in a universe. Where, like, this is a segue. <laughs> Let's hard steer back, back. To, back on track. Yes. <laughs> this is a backtrack. You turn. So I guess basically the anthropic principle is asking how much evidence can we take from the fact that we are here to observe something. 
Um, and I think Jess has come down very solidly on the side of that is almost no evidence at all. That is exactly one or, <laughs> piece of evidence. <laughs> would, would you say in a, in a rational sense that's asking a wrong question? Like this isn't a question where you can even imagine a coherent yes. answer? I think a question of how likely is the human race to survive the Cold War is partially answered by the fact that we did survive it. Maybe. Like everyone keeps saying how unlikely it is that we made it through the Cold War and maybe it was really unlikely, but maybe based on human psychology, actually, usually when put in these situations, most human races would make it through the Cold War because most people don't want to wipe out the entire human race. And who knows, maybe it's we should have lots of nuclear weapons because it's really unlikely anyone's ever going to use them in a in large enough capacity to wipe out the world. You had me with the first half. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't say that we should make it easier and lower the bar for someone who's not afraid to destroy the world to do it. Uh, but think... there were other almost end of world scenarios like the Cuban Missile Crisis could have ended could have ended in yeah. a large scale war. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that however unlikely it was to survive the last century, it wasn't impossible because we did. Do we should we not necessarily venerate people like Stanislav Petrov as no, much? Should. I mean, uh, if it was pretty likely we were going to make it through anyway. The, the thing that we do is we have a near miss. We notice the near miss take a moment to celebrate the fact that there was a near miss and people who are involved and then say, okay, now this could have gone badly. Let's think of the ways it could have gone badly and then come up with strategies for how to mitigate that in the future. And based on stuff we do have evidence for, <laughs> probabilities that we can calculate, like how the, it's a better question of like, you know, how, how likely was the cold, how, were we to have survived the cold war? Because there have been other wars and other types of crises that we can look at, get data from, and then actually do statistics on the those are the relevant parts of that question the like how likely is this specific event in a bunch of other universes this exact like you know the, the, it starts to get into like this isn't good math like this this isn't going to solve the problem this will maybe be like really really super extra meta mm -hmm. <laughs> thing that we can do thought experiments on but the the fact is that we survived the cold war there were factors involved we can look at those factors and and if we actually care about trying to like pre-mortem future conflicts then we should be doing this more than we are i think i think this stretches the usefulness at least of my ca capabilities as a bayesian um like how likely are we to survive uh fast ai takeoff we have we have no answer for that right yeah. because we don't have any priors that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful that doesn't mean that we shouldn't make some certain yeah. safeguards but like to say i have no priors i can't answer that question I could still say it's probably low. Like, I think there are way more ways to get it wrong than there are to get it right. And therefore, if you're just throwing a dart at random, you're more likely to miss than you are to get it, than you are to, are to hit it. Also, small caveat, there's a George Carlin joke that near misses are misnomers. They should be called near hits. Because it's like, oh, look at that car accident. They nearly missed, but they didn't. Um, <laughs> That's funny. <nice. laughs> like a third of his comedy for like 15 years is just wordplay. Um, so, like, I... I I struggle with the fact that just because we don't have priors doesn't mean that we can't make reasonable... Um... No, I definitely think when we're thinking about potential crises that could happen, that we should look into how likely is this crisis based on like what other similar sorts of data we can observe. And then but regardless of that, like the fact that this might happen and how bad it would be if it did happen means that we should try to come up with like strategies around it. That's definitely like, I'm not going to say that because the anthropic principle is not a valid question, then we should just throw out worrying about AI or anything ever. I didn't think you were saying that. I, I was more just trying to solve it myself. Cause like a century ago, there was no concern of nuclear war wiping out the species. Right. Um, right now, at least as of the time of recording at 428 on Sunday, the 23rd, <laughs> there's no chance. Let me, let me rephrase that. As of five minutes ago, there was no chance of AI wiping out the planet in the next five minutes. Um, that doesn't mean that it, there's a, that it's the kind of thing that we can't worry about, but it is the kind of thing that I can't put a probability on going smoothly or poorly. Um, so like trying to find statistics on how much to be concerned about this, it doesn't seem valuable. How many, I guess, one of my big questions would be how many crazy coincidences do you have to see before you start getting worried? Like how many times would you personally have to come very close to dying before you start saying, maybe, uh, maybe I should change what I'm doing. One, cause I want to live forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, you know, I, I definitely have been more careful about crossing streets since I was going to buy that car a few years ago. And that wasn't my first time almost getting hit, but it was the oldest I was, I think of almost getting hit. Right. 
like when you're a teenager you're not worried about that sort of thing mm-hmm. um so like i you know if i saw the exact same thing next time i'm on that intersection downtown with somebody leaving something in the street i'll let it get run over but you turned on the lhc three times or tried to anyway and the chances of you getting hit are much higher than the chance of the lhc not turning on how about uh you can you can conceive of events that might be harmful to you and you can then think about how bad is it going to be if this happens and then kind of run make a decision on what things you need to prioritize caring about like i look at okay what things are likely to kill me and i worry about car accidents <laughs> mm-hmm. and like the the things that are the most common things that kill people i worry about those before i start worrying about getting eaten by a shark when i swim in the ocean and most people are more worried about getting eaten by a shark in the ocean than they are dying every time they drive because we're bad at statistics. Um, something like AI takeoff is like, okay, how many times have people been killed by rogue AI in the past? Well, none, because we don't have any evidence. But how bad would it be if it happened? It would be really bad. So maybe that is worth, you know, escalating up the chain of things to worry about. Um, the A lot of people have died from being hit on the head by coconuts. It's statistically one of the more likely ways that people die. Do I have to worry about that? I mean... There's definitely a bunch of other things that are higher on that list. Uh, also, I don't live anywhere near a coconut tree, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's other there, there's definitely ways you can think of things that might be dangerous and might kill you and then try to decide how important is it that I come up with counter strategies for this thing or worry about it. And yeah. I don't think the anthropic principle has to come into play. But what if Google was like turning on a new server farm or something that had some of their They were like making Alpha StarCraft or something, right? An AI to play StarCraft really, really well. uh, The newest version. But every time they tried to turn it on, some really crazy wacky shit would happen where it didn't turn on. At some point, would you start to think maybe they shouldn't turn this on because Anthropic Principle says it's extremely unlikely this would have kept happening, so we must be in some... Yeah, um, in that case, like... If so anthropic principle is useful sometimes. If it's something like where I'm, I'm noticing confusion about the like the the universe seems to be behaving in a way that I wouldn't expect, um, then you start to be like, okay, something is happening. I notice I'm confused. I'm going to generate hypotheses for why this might be, and then decide what to do from there. So it's once the universe is behaving in ways you wouldn't expect. Yes. So in short, once you're surprised by how events are going. Yes. But you're not surprised that the cosmological constants are exactly what they are. Why do I have a cause to be surprised about that? I, I know how... Because unless there is no other option for them to be what besides what they are, then it's extremely unlikely they would be I just what they are. I have intuition about how likely it is for something to delay Google server farms to like turn on over mm-hmm. and over and over. And like the more like unlikely and the more common that is, the more you can be like, this is not the way the universe behaves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't know anything about how often life evolves or something like that or about what the universe states look like yeah yeah Yeah. i mean we have no idea at all what the constants can be but seeing that there's no reason they couldn't be something else is that not at all anything that uh influences your thinking i know enough about how the universe works to be confused when it's not working i don't know anything about how often life evolves or any of the big cosmological questions so i don't think that that i can be surprised or not surprised by it i think that's a succinct way of putting it for me too like i i don't find the cosmological constants uh i don't find the fine tuning of the universe surprising for some reason okay. um because we, again we happen to live in a universe where that didn't happen right i guess i'm failing to like make the thing click into place if, if there is one i think i'm with right now i'm i'm, I'm like jess is saying that if i i'm trying to paraphrase just to put this in my own head correctly as well like i have some expectation of what it looks like for this machine to keep failing to turn on mm-hmm. like because that i have a model of the universe where uh you know when you hit the switch things happen and if things keep stopping that from happening that is surprising because mm-hmm. i i have already a a i'm an understanding of how those things work what i don't have is an understanding of how universes are started or stopped or whatever right yeah how the cosmic con- how the constants are determined right yeah so like one of them i can find surprising because i have good reason for priors the other one i can find interesting but i am able to dismiss it 
anthropically without losing any sleep because it's like, well, yep, we live in a universe that allows life. Yeah. Um, I, I don't like, do I find that answer satisfying? Might be another kind of question. Like, do I find it satisfying that, well, we live in a universe where that's the case. I find not knowing things unsatisfying and I want to know more about them. I mean, I don't find it all surprising that we live in a universe where that's the case, because obviously, tautologically, we could only live in a universe that supports us. Tautologies are tight. Yeah. <laughs> the, oh, the, that would be a good t-shirt. <laughs> the question is, is there infinite universes with infinite constants, or is there only one where it, that just happened to have these constants? So that if that's the question... Um... I mean, that's basically the anthropic principle question, right? Because if there's infinite universes, then... The anthropic principle is in effect. There's almost infinite universes where you are dead now. I think that's I'm, a maybe, cool question, maybe and we have no way to go about starting to find out the answer. So right now, I can be like, "Huh, that's a question." Yeah, right. But it, what do you think is more likely that there's infinite universes? I or don't that... know. Oh <laughs> my god! I literally <laughs> can't tell you which thing I think is more likely because I have no evidence. I, th I think multiverse theory is more likely because a lot of other smart people think it's likely for other al for also other reasons, mm -hmm. and so it sounds like the scientific consensus is either already or is moving towards a direction where multiverse theory will be the predominant view of the multi-cosmos. And I and also so, think that's the most logical explanation because for there to be only one universe seems absolutely ridiculous to me. It would be weird. Yes. Um, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it, would be, it would seem counterintuitive, maybe. But if there's um, only one... But if there is an infinite number of universes and we're in just one of them, then the anthropic principle comes into effect in everything you do you're running off of the anthropic thing of like or the i don't know that you're a human and you're thinking about things in terms of the way humans think of things as causes and causers and it being important to discover why this thing is like that so you can determine the strategies of your enemies or friends and do political things because that's how we evolved and what we do i'm not it, thinking about causers at all i'm thinking about is there infinite universes or just one and I mean, like, but but the fact that that's the thing that bothers you, um, that you can't just say, I don't know, I don't have enough evidence yet. And then, like, there's other questions that we could be working on in the meantime means that you're obsessed about this idea of causality. I very much don't know, but I don't think it's a 50-50 coin toss. Why not? Because I think the it is extremely unlikely that there is only one universe with these constants if the constants can be anything. But how do you know that? How do you know that it's unlikely? You don't have any evidence that it is or isn't. If the constants can be anything, then it is unlikely just because they can be anything. And for them to be these particular numbers is, you know... But unlikely things happen all the time. Yeah, of course. It's the whole, like, if it's you... A, I'm just saying it's incredibly unlikely. So, like, pretending that there's, like, 36 knobs that can be tuned to any one of 100 values... Yes. They are, every every knob happens to be turned somewhere on the scale of 1 to 100 mm -hmm. that allows for the universe as we know it. Right. So just per that, if that's just a complete uh, dice roll, yeah. that sounds unlikely. You've yes. got 1 in 136 times. Um, so I see... I see Wait, I see what is the likelihood that those dials would be somewhere? Exactly. 100%. <laughs> so they, they'd have to be somewhere. I think for me, maybe I... I never did any formal research on anthropic pr principle other than like coming across it in the form of fine tuning arguments and stuff. Um, I've never seen anyone trying to leverage it to do actual work the way that we've been doing for the last hour. Oh, like, I've seen that a lot. Oh, see, I that's all, I think that, that's I'm finding it really interesting, but okay. I, I'm, I'm unprepared for it. So like, I I've always just seen it as this like, oh yeah, I guess that. Um, again, so like using the example of the Celsius scale, you know, if someone's surprised by that, they're wrong to be surprised because yeah. this was on purpose, yeah. or it is actually like, oh okay, yeah, I wonder what that would be like. Right. Um, we happened to live in a universe where. Uh, um, I mean, the, it's the, the, possible that there's some underlying physical law that makes it so all constants have to be exactly what they are in any universe, in which case having only one universe is fine, but the, there, it, I don't see any reason to believe that. And given that the constants, assuming that the constants could have been anything, it's extremely unlikely that we're not in an infinite universe scenario. I think since I already thought we were in an infinite universe scenario, that's mm -hmm. sort of my my fine. That's why I'm fine with that sort of assumption. Okay. Um, and maybe that's because that was put forward as a one of the possible answers to this in a book I read in 2004 or something. But if you like, I feel like there was a short part of a chapter in the God Delusion on the, on the anthropic principle. And if you already believe in an infinite universe's hypothesis, that should change your um, 
change at least some of your thinking. Like you should think that cryonics is a wonderful idea because no matter how unlikely it is, in at least one universe, it'll happen. I'm, and you might even want to be, depending on how much you care about other universes and the, your loved ones in other universes, you might be willing to take extravagant risks for big payoffs because, well, in most universes you'll die, but in the one that you actually remember and keep living in, you have a huge payout. Yeah, I'm hopeful that I live in a universe where Chronix ends up working and I'm preserved correctly, right? Like, the fact that I'm signed up increases my chances of being cryo reversed at some point right yeah, from um, zero to not zero right yeah. i mean so like i could still get burned in a fire in mm -hmm. which case even the fact that i'm signed up won't save me yeah. um so like i could still die in a way that keeps me from being put on ice which is a drag um i certainly don't want that to happen uh i mean you've thought of one of the things that could harm you death <laughs> and yeah. then you've taken one of the steps that you could to possibly mitigate it so you've adjusted things slightly more in your favor but you don't know how much because you don't know you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, I try to tweak the knobs in a way that lean towards me living forever, um, to the extent, especially to the extent that it's very easy. That's the best you like, can do for now. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you don't know, so you just try to mitigate against the forces that you do know and, and that, do have some evidence for, and totally. don't worry about it. <laughs> and like, arguably, cryonics isn't easy compared to like you know more people are killed by vending machines every year than sharks, <laughs> and so because of that, I don't rock vending machines. <laughs> like that's a lot. It's a lot easier or to not rock sharks. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot easier to not rock vending machines than it is to sign up for cryonics, right? Um, so like I have taken that somewhat not, f uh, easy step towards trying to increase my longevity. Um, it's not as hard as people think it is. That said, I should plug if I haven't before, Rudy Hoffman wrote a book <laughs> called the affordable immortal, which you can find on Amazon. <laughs> and he was nice enough to send me a copy of when I changed my policy with him, which I don't know if I ever properly thanked him for. So I'll send an email saying I thanked you and told all my listeners on my podcast that I do to <laughs> check out this book. Um, we will link the book, but also you don't necessarily need the book. A lot of times you can just follow a few instructions online. I know both uh, the Chronics Institute and Alcor have instructions online that you can follow and get signed up. Oh, yeah. This isn't necessarily an instruction manual. It al it's also just a case saying, like, more look, information about it. Yeah, it's just yeah. more information. Like, if you think that, oh, well, no, it's way it's way too expensive. It's way out of my... my, uh, my ability to do this it might not be gotcha um i mean generally if you can if you can spare 30 bucks a month you can totally afford to sign up for cryonics um depending on how healthy you are unfortunately my parents are older and not super healthy getting them a life insurance policy that would pay out for cryonics will be substantially expensive um that said it would probably be easier to get them to save up one hundred and ten thousand dollars each uh in cash and just you know, have this ready to pay for out of their estate rather than out of their life insurance. Yeah. Um, wouldn't be easy, easy, but it might be easier than getting them on a $700 a month life insurance policy or something. Mm, right. Yeah. So, so real quick, given that you, I, I've thought about this sometimes, given that you believe in infinite universes and therefore you believe there are many universes where you are dead due to the truck hitting you in the head or whatever. How do you feel about those other universes? I generally don't feel about them. Like I, I, I'm not trying to dodge the question. Like in the, in the circumstances where I actually think about it and I'm confronted with it, like I said, I do feel diminished in the, uh, the multidimensional light cone of that crosses the, whatever you call the thing, the multiverse is a part, you know, the universes are a part of multiverse mm -hmm. is fine. Mm -hmm. Um, the number of Stevens across times went down yeah um that's a bummer yeah yeah i mean it, it's kind of fun in that sense like a fun like fuck you sort of thing to like the utilitarian perspective like i can i can make the universe an amazing place here <laughs> locally um like it it would be a drag i and i'm sure peter singer's written on this having been a philosopher but like if you solve animal welfare the universe is still the multiverse is still aggregately full of suffering even if you save every cow on earth, um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like the multiverse is somehow still a slightly happier place because you've done that. You could even like, I mean, I lean utilitarian still, so I, I tend to couch my, and I, I tend to frame my arguments that way. But you don't even have to think about it in terms of like the amount of happiness in the universe, right? Yeah. Um, I I think that the kinds of societies with people that are caring about those sorts of things also are people that. It all comes back on happiness, like whether you're utilitarian or not. Like, I believe the term for how many, just to interject quickly, that how many use there are across the multiverse is measure. That your measure was decreased in that incident. 
even though you personally lived, your measure across the multiverse has was decreased. There was a movie in the early 2000s called The One. Yeah, um, I remember that. With Jet Li. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was fun. So whenever there were some thirty something universes, it wasn't. It was far from infinite. It was in the. It was in the dozens. And whenever one version it was of, at least hundreds, because at the very end we see hundreds of him all fighting it out. Oh, I thought it was only like thirty six or something. Uh, that was all that we saw. But okay. at the end we saw yeah a lot of hymns. Nice. Yeah. So the premise is that whenever one of you dies across the multiverse the like essence slash power slash literal physical strength is yeah. transferred to the survivors um, <laughs> maybe that was other maybe that was other criminals and not hymns that might have been other criminals I yeah think. yeah because I, 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 I vaguely just remember because the one was he killed off everyone else yes. yeah to get all the power and i think at the end so like then it's basically one guy universe hopping killing himself in other universes and then like it's down to him and the other version of him that doesn't really know why he's a lot stronger and faster than he used to be yeah and then this guy's trying to kill him and I think it ends with him like shutting that guy down in a non-lethal way. Yeah. Um, spoiler alert: the movie's twenty years old. So, got a question? Since oh wait, I just let me finish that thought. Yes. The downside is it doesn't seem like I absorbed all those dead Stevens' powers. <laughs> it would have been great yes. if I did. Well, if there's an almost infinite amount, you got to kill a lot of Stevens. <laughs> that could also be the Stevenators' power. So, dude, what, so what like, you got to do is go out there and take an insanely risky thing where you die ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time. And the you that survives is going to be ultra powerful and you can take over your universe. Or more cheaply, or I can just buy a ones. gun <laughs> and just do Russian roulette all weekend, every weekend. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, no, and I the, think I'm the... good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so somewhere along the line, like this might be a thing that like anthropically, historically, I live in a universe where I haven't died yet. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I want to test my luck. Okay. Right? I don't know why it doesn't mean that, but it does. That's a good question because it's called quantum suicide and it's a thing people have proposed like... If you if you really want a lot of money, set up some sort of uh, quantum random number generator. It would have to be quantum because if it's just mechanical random number generator, you'll have the same numbers in every universe. But quantum effects are truly random. So quantum random number generator, play that lotto with those numbers. If you lose, you shoot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the only universe where you survive is the one where you won the lotto. So basically what you do is you buy a lotto ticket, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, and you're like, oh, hey. I won the lotto. I'm so glad I don't have to shoot myself. That is all you see from your perspective. Okay, so what would it mean if tomorrow we saw a news headline? Mm-hmm. I'm going to propose two different headlines. One, somebody wins the lottery, okay. and they explain that's how they won. Okay. <laughs> the other the other version is that we see on the news that somebody killed themselves, and their suicide note said, here's what I was trying to do. Uh-huh. They tried to do a, qu- a quantum suicide lottery. If anything really mm-hmm. awesome ever happens to me that like gets me on the news, or if... <laughs> Like, really unfortunate things happen, and I end up committing suicide. In both cases, I think I'm going to write that letter. Awesome. <laughs> Just to fuck with people. Yeah. So that would be my my like theory as to what would be going on there, is that the person thought of that joke. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I, th- I, think, I think the idea of being joked with is, is a higher probability of actually happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the fact is, you, you're trading away almost all of your measure across all the multi-universes for a ton of money in one. I wouldn't do it because I don't know that whether there's a multiverse or not. Okay. And it's another thing that I have no way of knowing what, what the probability of it being a multiverse or not is. Yeah. Yeah, it would be cool if it were. Like it, it, it generates cool thought experiments. I like thinking about it. If you're totally selfish, if you're the kind of person who would defect against yourself in a prisoner's dilemma, yes. then this sounds like a great gamble for you, right? Because fuck all those other Stevens. I get to win the money. They're all oh, dead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and also, fuck all of your family and loved ones in all those other universes. I don't, I'm never going to meet them anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Hey, I actually have a thing to the plug. The family in this universe gets the Steven <laughs> gravy train. There's um a graphic novel, I think it's called The Infinite Vacation, that had some kind of... I'm trying to remember what the plot was. I can't exactly remember it was, but it's something to do with multiverses and multiple versions of a guy being part of just like really trying to remember. I, I don't know. There, there was this convoluted thing that happened, and it was one of them trying to switch lives. Oh, that was it. Yeah, they they were like there was interdimensional uh, payment system for if you want to switch lives with one of your other selves. Hmm. <laughs> Does someone else? in one of your other selves also have to sign up for that service? Yeah, like it, it has to be like a mutual agreement. Well, that uh, sounds like a shit like, deal then, basically, because their life would suck enough like, where they want to switch, like, too. Like, what if you were, like, Steven, uh, th- like, what, what if you're you now, except, like, maybe you're having some kind of financial crisis, and then, like, you from a universe where everything's exactly the same, except for there's a lot more mosquitoes comes and is like, hey, I'll give you the amount of money you need. 
like in order to deal with your car accident or whatever if like you switch universes with me where everything will be the same but there will be more mosquitoes do i get to know what i'm signing up for before i click yes or do i just do i just have to know that some other steven another timeline wanted to switch universes i I don't know like i don't think the graphic novel goes into because that actually actually drastically adjusts how much i'd be willing to do this because if i got to know and i'm like you know what i'm okay with more mosquitoes i'd rather have 10 million dollars than i would do that if all i knew is that another steven also wanted out of their universe (laughs) oh god i would think no fuck that yeah i can cope with mine because of quantum differences that steven might be different than you and have different values what if the universe was exactly the same except this other steven had no back trouble he perfectly healthy back except he was in a lot of financial debt at what level of financial debt would you not make that trade i mean how how disastrous to my life is the financial is it like say student That's loan debt question. where i get but like you know is it like student <laughs> loan debt where i get 30 years to pay it off and it's like something i can live with or is it just like you're going to be homeless forever probably not homeless homeless but maybe living out of your car and working 14 hours a day hmm the car stuff sounds like a drag. If it was like student loan debt, where it's like you're paying this this horrible deal for you interest, yeah. I would say two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, at, you know at least that's a quick guess because that's an upper end of what people spend on school, yeah. and it gets them fuck all. I mean, you get credentials. Don't get me wrong. Go to school if you want to. I'm <laughs> I'm moderately against. This is super tangential. I think depending on your on your industry that you're inter- that you're pursuing, you can trade school your way there a lot faster and cheaper, and you certainly don't need a credential from an ivy league school to like uh i don't know um i'll, I'll poke fun at brian we, my co-host we've... and we want more he's an he was an english major yeah. i don't know where he went to school if he got an english major from harvard i think that's super funny like it, to, to imagine him right now still paying off harvard student loan debt yeah. well actually it wouldn't be because he went to school when school was more affordable but let's pretend he had two hundred thousand dollars worth of student loan debt to pay off an, an english, english major. major yeah or you know so we, we don't need to make fun of an individual we don't need to make fun of someone who maybe didn't do that john mulaney i think was one hundred twenty thousand dollars in student loan debt the comedian i remember getting getting a, a, a yeah an English major. So we've already had the school talk discussion, but I think it's an interesting way to phrase, to rethink about how much you're willing to pay for something. Mm-hmm. Like if I could swap into a universe where I didn't have this problem, how much do, how much yeah, financial how much would that debt be worth would that for person, me? yeah, <laughs> would I still be willing to make that trade? And at what point is the debt so crushing that I wouldn't make that trade? That is a good intuition pump, actually. I think, at the, I think it would be crushing for me at the level where I'm homeless. Like that's mm-hmm. a big drag. Okay. Or like, what if you had to just live in a really shitty neighborhood? Where there's, you know, gunshots, there's often cockroaches in your house, but it's all you can afford because you got all this debt. I feel like a cockroach, I feel like I could cockroach proof my place. Yeah, and I've, those and I, fuckers and I've, are... I've lived, I lived in places that are adjacent to like, you know, not uh, base, I don't know, to, to higher than what I'm comfortable with base levels of, of, of violence running around. Okay. And it's crazy cheap. It's dope. 300, yeah. 370, $370 a month for rent. Man, those were the days. I am um, no longer willing to live in a place where I have to worry about my stuff. Like, I always lock my doors just because it's a good habit. But if my door were to not be locked, I wouldn't be worried because no one in this to? neighborhood needs money so badly they would risk jail time to walk into my house and steal things. On the plus side, on the plus side, if you're broke as fuck, you don't have any stuff worth taking. So people break into stealing. That's true. Have it, you so. had stuff stolen before? Me? Yeah. No. It's just something that bothers you about having to have that paranoia in the background. Yes, I, I, I don't want to live in that constant. I yeah. feel you on that. It, that. That would be stressful. My childhood growing up, we used to just not lock the doors to our house every. Oh, really? <laughs> and uh, I get a little bit frustrated now with like having to lock doors and worry about my stuff being stolen in the background, both because like, A, now I live in an area where it's like, you know, I live in an apartment. It's maybe not the best area. It's more likely people might take my stuff. By the way, not the best area in Denver is like one of the nicer areas in a lot of other cities. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like there might be like a tattooed person smoking on a street corner. <laughs> Or like a piece of litter blowing by in the wind and you're like, oh man, this is, this is a bad area. <laughs> <laughs> There's gum stuck to that bench. I mean, I was in Denver for like a month before I saw my first needle on the sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, and I almost, you know, I could have stepped on it. That would have been uncomfortable. There's some um, places in the area that are much worse, but they're not They're downtown. still not bad. Like, yeah, they're, uh, they're f- when I visited you, when I was like visiting to see if i wanted to move here for the first time and i crashed at your place and i was driving around a bunch of different areas. I remember people saying, I think West Colfax is the area with a reputation. And I, I like went there and I'm thinking about Atlantic City level bad and I'm walking around like this is the bad area of Denver. <laughs> like you guys are spoiled as fuck. Oh. <laughs> we got it pretty good compared to other a lot of other places. Um you know, as it's far certainly as, not as bad as Gotham in I, any of the movies I've seen recently. That's right. Yeah, Gotham but it doesn't have awful. Batman. So I, I don't <laughs> how bad would you want your city to be if it meant that you also got to have a Batman? I don't know. It? I mean uh, about as bad as Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Batman doesn't seem to have done all that much good for Gotham. <laughs> 
<laughs> considering how shitty Gotham still is. I also never got why like everyone stood stayed in Gotham. The Muggles, I get like they can't afford to move. I mean, the super villains. Why not go two towns over where there is no mass crusader and oh, oh. just go go commit crimes? You know, two states over. Yeah. That would be a good uh, Batman fan. Maybe pick. they're in it for the challenge. They want to fight. Yeah, Batman. they're all insane, which yeah. is why they exist. Have you but... written a rationalist Batman yet? Have you read um, the masculine mongoose? Uh, yeah. Okay, it's not a rationalist Batman, but it's really fun. I remember um, Alexander Wales at one point said that he was thinking about doing a rationalist Batman, but never got there. Alexander, if you ever get the impulse, I will oh support you on Patreon to do that. Yeah. I keep occasionally thinking about doing a rationalist Dragon Ball. Oh, that could be fun. Not like, I mean, there's still going to be magic and stuff in it, but more of just like give all the characters a level up in intelligence because it's a show that most of the plot is driven forward by somebody holding the idiot ball and basically all characters kind of holding the idiot ball at all times. Mm. Like that, they, they're they just, you know, solution to everything is punch it harder. <laughs> well, what do you expect? <laughs> Even it's when a, like... The, it's a show about punching things hard. So the thing that I would do is, and if anyone also wants to steal this idea, it, it might have even been done, like I, I might do it someday, but Bulma... Uh, the, the the Dragon Ball show is like, if, for people that aren't familiar, there's like a little kid with magic powers and a girl who's like the scientist, the the, the daughter of the scientist who invented uh, capsule technology. It's basically like you can stick stuff into a Pokeball or whatever and some other shit. And she's really intelligent too. And she meets this kid and then they go on adventures and it eventually like levels up to the scale of universes fighting universes in martial arts tournaments. <laughs> but like... The fact that Bulma is a genius scientist is never used, mm. and like the, she can't punch the fact that yeah, that there's any other solution to anything other than f- punching things hard enough that you start glowing and your hair turns a different <laughs> color because you've punched things hard enough that you can now punch things harder. <laughs> it's a cool power. I'm picturing like Superman throwing a baseball at like relatively six speeds. Yeah, and is that what makes them change colors in Dragon Ball Z, or is that just no. like literally their magic powers? It's, a, it's oh, okay. part of magic powers. It's, it's it was... the color of their chi or whatever. Like, it, okay. they, it's funny that like. I do like that the author is self-aware sometimes and will make fun of himself while writing it. Like, I've I've discovered Super Saiyan Blue! <laughs> what does it do? It makes you blue! <laughs> is that it? I think I'm more powerful too, but mostly look at my hair! <laughs> Like, it's, it's almost like word for word, kind of one of the things that happened in the show. They will occasionally also point out that the main character, the good guy Goku, um, who's like the adult that the little kid in original Dragon Ball grew up to be, like... One of his defining characteristics is happy go lucky. Another is just constantly needs to be challenged in battle, and that like he has also been responsible for probably causing a lot of the conflict hmm. in the show because other people are wandering around the universe looking for somebody strong to fight and conquer. And the fact that he's there on Earth means that like Earth is getting targeted to be destroyed more often. <laughs> so like they actually address that in universe, and also and like they're like, hey Goku, like maybe it would be cool if you didn't like just care so much about fighting evil things that you sometimes get bored and pick a fight with like evil space warlords and he's like haha nah i can't not do that has has anyone <laughs> suggested that he live on a planet without a large population like he likes living on earth and he's, he's okay with... <laughs> he's like i can punch things yeah, so what does it matter he's, he's, so far he's had a pretty good track record of being able to punch everything fucking and... anthropic principle <laughs> <laughs> he's punched everything so far and no one's strong enough to coerce him to live on another planet yeah. like hey why don't you fuck off for a while because we're sick of almost being killed every other month another we, really see, we great didn't joke. see the anime of all the universes where he died yeah. <laughs> now another really great joke that the show does is also that earth has the most delicious food in the universe so there's a lot of um allies who have incentive to keep earth around because earth like has ramen for example (laughs) and a bunch of other planets have like just really boring food and they're like oh man that's that planet that has the really strong guy but and it's also got instant ramen and like fruit salad have you tried fruit salad is it that hard to grow fruit trees (laughs) i'm I'm not i'm not a i'm not a scientist but i gotta think ramen is not that hard to make in the scale of like you know universal technology well it it definitely is like playing you know it's lampshading that oh no 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 no, i'm getting it 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 sounds like a really funny show but aren't there like 900 episodes oh god uh, yeah it's it's been and most of them are filler my entire life this thing has been ongoing and i like oh my god (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, it, sound, it sounds it's great. Still going. I, I don't think I'll ever be able to get into it. Maybe I'll watch like an hour long appreciation video that summarizes yeah, more no, of this like, stuff later. Definitely, but. it drags. The, some of the movies in the more recent show are kind of worth watching, but even they are like very slow paced. I've got a quick plug. Oh, wait, sorry, what were you going to say? I was just going to say we should wrap up and move on. Oh, cool. Yeah. Then yeah. before we do that, okay. this, is, this is a rationally adjacent subject. Okay. There was uh, like a one off sequel chapter to Death Note that came out, I think, just like in the last month. 
Um, did you by chance read it? Not the one off, no. You should. Okay. The I one... actually didn't read the manga either. I just saw the anime. Yeah. If you saw that, you're close enough. The manga is a lot better. Um, but it always is. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the, I really liked the anime a lot. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was because I saw it first, but also like seeing it with color and music was actually a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, the only thing you get more of in the manga I is love their is... intro theme in the second season. Uh, it's always an art downgrade for I manga like the first to more. animation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The but I mean the the art yeah I mean the art downgrade is there too but like as far as just I liked the the shading like again the different color cells they could do for different things they did like the five minutes of just a character thinking I think somewhat <laughs> engaging um, all you get in the manga is more uh, I kind of refuse to say manga I will but I can it's like if you go to a Mexican restaurant and order a quesadilla or a quesadilla right? like if you, if you like or if you go to, if you go to a French restaurant and order and order a croissant and not a croissant do, right do you also call it Japan animation uh no I call it anime okay yeah um I I, I I'm, I'm fine for it what I what I, oh. I, I'm, oh yeah okay anime I'm, I'm I'm fine calling it either way <laughs> what I'm not is that if someone were to correct me yeah I would bring up my like hold do you do you order a croissant when oh, you go oh, to, oh, when you go okay. to a pastry shop no you order a croissant you say it how you say it in your dialect yeah. But I'm fine with anyone saying it with a soft A or a long A. We have an interesting uh, listener feedback about that same topic. Oh, no. I just, I'd never heard man- m- manga? Manga, manga. Manga? I'd never heard manga before. I'd always heard people say manga. So that's, that's how because I that's, it. That's how, you, that's how, if you're phonetically saying it, that's how it's A said in Japanese. Okay. And Japanese written in English is awesomely consistent, where a single A is pronounced ah every mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, it's not like in English where it's like, guess or fuck you when you're trying to figure out the rules <laughs> or like um, other languages which have those sounds but then have some kind of like signifier that this is a soft e like two dots over it or whatever yeah <laughs> like, under it. Think, like yeah in english is just like i don't know you just got to memorize how words you said exactly i'm so glad it was my first language mm-hmm. i said manga uh growing up or i guess as i my first introduction to it because it's spelled a lot like mango and uh-huh. that's how you say mango okay. um that said all you get more of in the manga manga is longer thought out stretches um but there's plenty of those in the in yeah, the, the plot's in the slightly different too they sped it up a bit for they did slowed it down a bit yeah the they, they did some you know adaptations for animation that made sense considering very, that yeah no I'm, I'm i'm only saying that death note's great everyone should check it out in either format um it's better than it's better written down but it, it never isn't so that said there's a one-off chapter that has basically the setup is I don't want to spoil it, but it's an it's another it, it's almost like a fun. I could put it to you this way: if you had the Death Note, and you wanted to find a way to make it, to use it to make your life a lot better, how would you do it without killing anybody? Isn't the only thing it does kill people? Oh no! It was so uh, apparently so, those other so, things so, too. So, so don't don't spoil it if you've read this. I haven't read it, okay. but my like. Well, the one thing I know is that not only does it only kill people, but you can tell them what they do before they die, and that's the way that they will die. And I wonder if there's a way that you could set it up to write something that's like, this is the way this person dies, and you talk about, like, here's how Elon Musk dies. First, he, you know, invents uh, as many things as you could think of, and then, like, he, like, solves world hunger, and then and then he dies as an old man in his bed, oh, like, oh, okay. <laughs> after having, to, I, to get I, around I that, know. the one of the rules is that you can only control someone's actions up to 23 days before they die. Oh, I forgot about uh, that. So, yeah, there's the 23-day limit, um, but... So you could find people who are probably going to die within the next 23 days anyway, some kind of terminal illness. You, you could try to do something like that, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be bad if you didn't mind killing them to say, like, all right, cool, so this asshole, you know, who, whatever, this Wall Street prick or whatever, uh, I've determined that I'm okay killing them. I'm going to have them send me $10 million in cryptocurrency, you know, uh, in a hidden way before they die. Like... So that would be one way to do it if you're going to kill somebody. That, if you're, that if you're still go- sounds like you have chosen to rob and murder someone. It does. Okay. So, my, But what's fun about this is that the one-off chapter is kind of like, like I said, if the problem to you posed was, say, if you, Inyash, didn't want to kill people, mm. but you didn't want to pass up the opportunity to, you know, not use this for your own personal benefit, how would you do it? It's okay. a really fun thing. It took me 10 minutes to read. I think you'll have a great time with it. That sounds super interesting. So I will put this in the show notes, too. There is a, a, a one-off. Uh, it's important to note that it's a sequel to Death Note. Like, it takes place... Uh, is it written by the original author, or is this, like, a fan work? I think it's the original author. Oh, cool. Um, if it's not, it is very compellingly done in the exact same art format. Yeah, that um, art style is very attractive. Yeah. I, I've always admired that one. I wish, um, I mean, to go off on a quick tangent, um, my complaint about a lot of anime and manga, and why I haven't kept up with it, is that it's so derivative. 
very infrequently do you find new types of stories, new character archetypes, new art styles. That's, the, that's <laughs> true of basically all media, though. Yeah, um, not less so in, like, like, Western film tends to keep evolving, whereas because of Japanese culture and people liking the same thing over and over again, like, a lot of it tends to say the same more than it does in cultures that prefer more novelty. Hmm. But, um... But, you know, you still get you still occasionally get the one punch man's yeah, and yeah. like the, the unique stuff uh, of Samatsu san. Uh, uh, what what the heck is that one with the weird anime girls? Magical Madoka. Well, no, that that was good, too. Um, art style is derivative, but new kind of story. That was cool. I'm thinking of the one with like the two high school girls who are shaped like anatomically very strange. And it's a bizarre parody show. Hmm. Um, oh, Pop Team stuff. Epic. It's actually on Netflix. <laughs> I don't know if I recommend it or not. I would recommend skipping around a little bit and watching some of it to get an idea of what it is, but it was a style of humor that it's so Japanese that it doesn't translate well even to somebody like me who's a big weeb and has been pretty immersed in Japanese culture. Like that there's some like specific jokes about stuff that are just like first of all for people in their 30s probably and secondly like something that maybe like a TV commercial you might have seen on TV when you were a kid if you lived in Japan. <laughs> and I'm like I bet that's funny if you know that context. So there's a lot of that, but then there's also a lot of just very strange deconstruction of anime archetypes things going on that are pretty enjoyable. As long as we're pitching this, everyone needs to read, not watch Berserk. Um, <laughs> okay. It's a long read. It's like at 37 volumes. It's been going on for over 30 years, uh, but there was like several long year hi hiatuses. Um, if you have to watch anything, watch the 1997 anime. But no, that only encompasses like oh, six it... volumes of the 37 volumes that are out. Is it so. the new Berserk anime, one of those ones where they did it in CGI and they tried to make it look drawn, but it still looks terrible? It looks... At parts of it kind of look like South Park, uh, um, but I wish that's like it's getting better. That technology is getting better. I'm holding out my hopes that eventually uh, there's a few things that were done, and this is such a tangent. We should get back to topic. I will just say that the new, the new, the, the two new seasons <laughs> finally did stuff. They also made movies in the early 2000s that covered the same arc as the 1997 anime. What the new movies did, or the new seasons did, was finally cover after that stuff. We've been waiting mm -hmm. 20 years for it, and I was just loving seeing things with music and motion again and color, yeah. um, but everyone hated it so much that they canceled it, so <laughs> fuck those guys. Just learn to enjoy what you get. <laughs> I'd rather see it not exist than see it like this. It's like, no, fuck you. All right. As long as we're recommending things, I'll recommend a really short thing. I absolutely love Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. It was fu like, okay, so first of all, you have to already love the character of Harley Quinn or people like her. Which everyone does. Not everyone. No, I've no, met quite a few people that don't, but I, I am absolutely me, the fan of like the crazy Genki riot girl that is just carefree as fuck, murders people, lots of violence, doesn't care, doesn't matter, right? And this is that kind of movie. It's cartoonish slapstick comedy all over the place with fucking ultra violence thrown in constantly and it was so much fun i loved it i loved it for the same reason i love tank girl because tank girl's got the same kind of thing and i just i had the most fun i've had in a movie in a long time cool i really want to see it like I, I, there's movies i like better for artistic reasons but in terms of just fun oh my god so good in terms of exceeding my expectations i can endorse it as strongly okay because um, <laughs> you were expecting <laughs> suicide squad 2 well so i was expecting suicide squad 2 and the trailer looks terrible okay you, you see the trailer and you're like none of this makes sense even if you like harley quinn mm -hmm. this looks like a shit movie okay. that's how we went and saw it on opening weekend and i loved it awesome i thought it was great i didn't want to sell you on it too hard lest mm -hmm. you lest it fall short like shit. I gave, gave what i meant to high. say is this is a pretty good movie you should think <laughs> about seeing it <laughs> I, I think well, I think it's for, it's for many a people, specific person. I think for many people it'll it'll surpass expectations. Okay, especially if your bar is Suicide Squad. I know. Go in there and enjoy it. The I'm, person I went to see it with, Charlie, didn't like it, but that's because she doesn't she doesn't like the uh, Harley Quinn character type. Then she what doesn't was she like doing crazy a Harley Quinn movie. Uh, she was singing it mainly for me. Oh yeah, but she doesn't like crazy people who are just crazy for the hell of it, and I do, so it worked out. Yeah, people have. I mean, um. I also really enjoy movies that are just fun in a way that appeals to me, but surprisingly enough, some people don't think that just like fun, jolly ultra violence <laughs> is is really fun to watch. Um, they're weird. Yeah. I, I don't know. I agree. <laughs> uh, should we? 
go on to the next part of our podcast that's going on for quite a while. No, we should wrap it up. I'm really disappointed because I wanted to get to the less wrong posts. We haven't those, done those in a long time. And I wanted to get the feedback because there's a few good things of feedback. Should our next episode just be feedback and less wrong posts? Or <laughs> will that make everybody sad? No, that would make everyone sad. It probably would. Other topics okay. Too. Well, how about um, whatever our next episode is, we really try hard to keep it like time boxed yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we can actually get to the other things that we sometimes do oh, we should like have a timer or something with an alarm that goes off no. I, I mean it's up to you guys okay also it's for, it's worth no- noting that this is the first time we sat down to record each other so record with each other in a while since yeah. the live episode i think sorry yeah. for more tangenty than usual yeah, yeah. and that's... just we're enjoying each other's company again so like i was Hopefully out you're enjoying it too and you guys did like remote at that point and then there was another remote one and yeah it's been a while i really don't like recording remote as much as being in the room with people no, I've, I've been really digging into my phone phobia recently uh i found out that one of the reasons that i hate phone calls is that i lose a lot of context with tone of voice facial expression and body language mm-hmm. and i have such a hard time with those things anyway being on the spectrum that when you take away more data that i need to figure out what people are saying and what the context is yeah. then it's and, and probably most people also feel like this phones are terrible they okay. used to not be as terrible, like in the 90s where people had landlines. And yeah, I heard that landline, like I, I kind of... The, the quality was a major selling point, And like you could hear someone like just slightly intake their breath, like they're about to say something, you know? It was it yeah. was almost like being there in the room, except you couldn't see them. And not seeing them, that is a big deal. Like being face-to-face with someone is much better than phones. But yeah. And but... you were more dedicated to the call having to be in the room with the phone. Yes. Rather than just have the phone with you wherever you happen to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were paying attention to the phone because you couldn't do much else. Right. Yeah, it was it was very different. Phones nowadays suck. Get that's, together with people. That said, there's a great Keen Peel sketch, which we'll also throw in the show notes, uh, about <laughs> how... A, easy it is to misinterpret the messages of somebody via text mm. oh. uh, you read into it wrong sorry yeah. we're, we're just recommending so many things but oh um malcolm gladwell's new book talking to strangers ta- like the whole book is about this and it's so good oh. i kind of want to re- do a review of it at some point let's do that for our next episode oh sure i'd All love right. to do that i gotta finish it first though okay I, oh, I'll, I'll so be done by then. Just... I gotta, I gotta give it back to the library. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I have to finish it. We have our tap book for in two weeks. Perfect. Awesome. Hell yeah! So this time for real in two weeks, we will be talking about the less wrong posts. Hold on a sec. Update yourself incrementally and one argument against an army. Which oh man, and these tie in yeah, with the things we too. talked about today too. Yeah, so uh, it's okay. We can find ways to tie them into other things. We happen not to live in a universe where we got around to listening to these <laughs> or to, to getting to these. What we really got to do is set a bomb at every single one of our recordings, and if we don't get to our <laughs> things, it explodes. So the only universes where podcasts come out are the ones where we got to them. If you think that's a good idea, write in <laughs> on the subreddit or email us or comment on this episode at the Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast or excuse me at Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast dot com. Or uh, if you, what should we make our reward limit be? If you want us to set a bomb in the room for the next episode, <laughs> donate us, don't or pay, donate, donate to us on Patreon at the thousand dollar level. Yeah, and we will buy a small bomb to put in the room for episodes. Um, no, that's no, only, no, no, that's no, only. I wouldn't ethic. say every episode. One episode, I'd be willing to do it for one. Yeah, yeah. For every thousand dollars that you give us, we'll yes. we'll record an episode with a bomb in the room. Yeah. Um, if and you, I guarantee if you don't want we'll to, get to our feedback and shit. <laughs> if you don't want to donate at that level, you can donate at a, a more humane level to us at mm-hmm. Patreon.com. I really hope that we don't have any rich fans now. Like I, they, I used to not worry about that. <laughs> the money will have to come in first for us to afford the materials. I will commit right. to doing an episode of the bomb in the room I if totally we get a thousand bucks. Would you? Hold on, we gotta we gotta get buy-in from all three hosts. Uh, considering. Yeah, hell, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because I'll, I'll roll that dice. Yeah. That yeah, die. me too. I don't think anyone's going to waste that money. So, right. but if you want to do it at the smaller level, we also have those options on the website as well, or on the Patreon website as well. So, well, I, I am willing to trade a tiny bit of measure in the tiny percent of universes where the bomb explode, explodes on accident for a thousand dollars and all the other universes where it doesn't. And as uh, if anyone at this point is unaware, I'm also like 20. Wait, I guess 16 episodes into a podcast called We Want More. It's mm. a read through with a uh, non rationalist, non um, already read, uh, a, a non rationalist person who hasn't already read Harry Potter and Methods of Rationality, where I'm doing sort of a We've Got Worm ripoff with them, where uh, basically we're going through it uh, a couple chapters at a time and 
getting reactions and discussing chapters every episode that airs weekly on Mondays. It's really fun, guys. You and get to hear about how a non-rationalist reads the stuff, and you get to like go through the whole HPMR again, which I haven't done in years. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it now because, uh, I mean, as a rationalist, I was listening to it. I realized how much like bias I have in favor of it because I kept having the reaction. I think I actually texted you once or twice. That was like, man, Brian just doesn't get it. This, mm. and then I was like wait a minute, a couple of things Brian said I actually agree with, and now I'm like, oh, I realize I'm getting defensive about things that he has a good point about <laughs> occasionally. I still do that. I will say a couple things about it. One, uh, while I don't know if he's jumping on the rational, or is drinking the rationalist Kool-Aid yet, he is enjoying the story more. It only took uh, <laughs> three months, um, <laughs> but he's having more fun. So if you find that his constant shitting on it in the first two episodes is turning you off, that stops. And that is a Doof Media podcast production. So you can check out our website on uh, doofmedia.com and uh, find us over there. Or currently still on Enosh's uh, HPMOR podcast feed. But we're moving it over because it's going to be way too confusing. So yeah. this outro took us only seven minutes. Excellent. All right. Yay. And yeah, uh, tell people about this podcast. Um, leave comments and reviews. That helps uh, it get out to more people. If you would like to donate um, a buck a month for this thing, we'd really appreciate that too. And that won't risk our lives. Uh, and that will not risk our lives, yeah. Ooh, maybe we should have a competing thing. I was just thinking that. Like if 100 people donate $10, then the bomb gets taken out again. So there's no risk to our life. <laughs> and that way we get $2,000. <laughs> we will discuss the details of the bomb situation should that ever come up. Okay. All right. Cool. We'll set up like a new reward system where it's like, if you want us to not have a bomb in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're holding ourselves hostage. Perfect. Uh, okay. Like, we should leave. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> So uh, we have to thank the patron, as always. Uh, we would like to once again thank Emilio Alvarez for uh, making this podcast available to everybody in a general sense, and this specific episode to everyone with their request for us to discuss the Anthropic Principle. It, it was a lot of fun, and anyone else who wants us to, dis to discuss something can donate uh, $10, and we will do that. And also, um, just wanted to say that I hope we didn't mangle the discussion too badly. I hope Emilio feels like he got at least a little bit of his money's worth. Yeah, let us know if you got your money's worth. If you didn't, we'll touch the topic again. And also, yeah, you, you, I think he's got hosting uh, co-host. Yeah, yeah, uh, he can level. always come on. So yeah, you can come tell us why we're wrong. Yep, mm -hmm. please do. That'd be awesome. Yeah, great. All right, thanks everybody. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Good night, everybody.